What comes to mind when you think of a supernova? You probably think of a massively destructive cosmic event, a star exploding in magnificent fashion and annihilating everything unfortunate enough to lie in its path. While this isn't exactly wrong, it may not be the whole picture. What if we told you that supernovae help to create as much of our universe as they destroy, or that our very existence may be thanks in large part to a supernova? A new discovery in astrophysics may mean just that. Today we are going to talk about research that may have just changed our fundamental understanding of the way stars are formed and galaxies are shaped. A supernova is somewhat loosely defined as a celestial phenomenon wherein a star explodes, possibly by way of a gravitational collapse which results in a sudden and massively increased luminosity by an object which emits an enormous amount of energy and sometimes leaves behind an extremely dense core. This transient astronomical event can last anywhere from milliseconds to days, weeks, months, and even several years. Like any star, supernovae can vary widely in terms of size, energy, and observable luminosity depending on many factors. There are numerous statements made from the scientific community on exactly how much energy is emitted from various supernovae. For some reference on just how spectacular these events can be, in June of 2015, Astronomers from Ohio State University discovered a supernova using the All-Sky Automated Survey for Supernovae, dubbed SN2015L. SN2015L was reportedly over 500 billion times brighter than our Sun, and 20 times brighter than all of the combined light emitted by the Milky Way galaxy. The largest supernova observed to date was named SN2016APS, with its estimated mass being between 50 and 100 times that of our Sun. But how could such massive objects, which release so much energy, actually form anything, rather than simply crushing everything in their wake? We know that when a star collapses, resulting in a supernova, it creates new elements depending on the type of supernova that occurred. The products of a supernova can be oxygen, helium, nickel, iron, and many more. But how do these elements come together to form new stars and even planets? Well, a new discovery using 3D mapping of galactic dust may help explain just that. Stars form within molecular clouds with dense concentrations of gas and dust. These clouds are extremely cold, so cold that the gases become molecular, hence molecular clouds. This means their atoms bind together. The most common molecules in these interstellar gas clouds are carbon and hydrogen. When the cold causes these molecules to bind at high enough densities, the cloud cores collapse under their own gravity and form stars. Because these regions are so dense with gases, they are opaque to visible light and are referred to as dark nebulas, which means scientists use infrared and radio telescopes to study them. Perseus and Taurus are two molecular clouds filled with gas where stars form, with the Taurus formation being the closest currently known star formation region to Earth, at about 430 light years away, and the Perseus formation being around 1000 light years away. It has long been speculated that the two clouds were located near to one another. When looking at them two dimensionally, they even appear to touch, because of the forced perspective from the Earth. But this new data from Gaia, a space telescope launched by the European Space Agency, helped create a 3D map of the clouds that suggests the existence of a massive, spherical-shaped void between the clouds that extends some 500 light-years. This new 3D data allowed scientists to see more accurately the relationship between Perseus and Taurus. Dr. Shmuel Bialy an astrophysicist for the Harvard and Smithsonian Center of Astrophysics has been mapping out these clouds for years. He believes that this giant void discovered between the star-forming cloud regions is the result of a supernova that occurred over 10 million years ago, and that this discovery is the first data of its kind that goes to show astronomers exactly how a supernova can, in time, result in the formation of stars. It was odd, to say the least, for astronomers to find such a large, empty region of space given that most of space is abundant with stars, dust, gas, and rocky objects. Bialy says that this cavity must be the aftermath of a very powerful event which cleared out the area of 500 light-years. The data also shows that Perseus and Taurus are not actually two separate clouds, but rather that they both formed from one event, and that event being the supernova of a star. Remember, a supernova is the result of a star collapsing under the weight of its own gravity, which results in the explosion we call a supernova. This new data suggests that the explosion of a star sends the material that comprised the star bursting outward, and whatever is left behind creates clouds of dust and gas like Perseus and Taurus. 
Over time, that material will eventually compress to form new stars born from the aftermath of a supernova. This process has long been theorised, but this is the first time it has been observed happening in space. Essentially, we've known about the existence of these clouds and that they do in fact form stars, but how the clouds came to be in the first place was only theorised until this observation. According to Dr. Bayali, hundreds of stars are either forming or already exist on the surface of this vast void. He says there are two theories as to how the Perseus-Taurus supershell was formed. The first is that a singular supernova occurred in the centre of this void and pushed the gases outward. The second theory is that a series of supernovae occurred over millions of years and eventually formed this sort of vacuum in space, surrounded by the gas and dust clouds referred to as the Perseus-Taurus supershell. In either case, scientists' theories that star-forming gas clouds are ultimately the result of supernova events have seemingly been proven. Though the Perseus-Taurus supershell is the only currently observed instance of this void in space, these are not the only star-forming regions in space, let alone in our local group, which consists of two collections of galaxies that include our Milky Way galaxy. Some of these other star-forming regions include the Orion Nebula, Westerhout 40, Omega Nebula, the Eagle Nebula, among others. The most recent known supernova to have occurred in our Milky Way galaxy is referred to as Cassiopeia A, it's estimated that the light from this supernova first became visible to Earth in the late 17th century. The supernova happened about 11,000 light years away from Earth, and the cloud of material that remains can be observed in the form of visible light from Earth with amateur telescopes and spans approximately 10 light years across space from our perspective. Near-Earth supernovae are defined as a supernova which occurs in close enough proximity to Earth to have notable effects on Earth's biosphere, which is thought to be about 30 to 1,000 light years away from Earth. It is estimated that 20 supernova explosions have occurred within 1,000 light years of Earth over the last 11 million years, and have been associated with the global warming effects here on Earth of 3 to 4 degrees Celsius. On average, a supernova occurs within just over 30 light years of Earth, once every 240 million years. Its global warming effects are mostly the effect of gamma rays, also known as gamma radiation, which is an electromagnetic radiation that comes from the decay of atomic nuclei. With this context, the thought of a near-Earth supernova occurring during your lifetime can be absolutely terrifying. But unless you plan on living millions of years, you've probably got nothing to worry about. On the contrary, in light of this new discovery, we should probably be glad that supernovas exist in the first place. Without them, we wouldn't have the molecular clouds of gas, which eventually form the stars and planets that make up galaxies, including our own Milky Way galaxy. So in a way, our very existence is in part thanks to supernovae. With well over a trillion stars spanning 10 million light years across the local group, as well as dozens of discovered galaxies, it becomes apparent that it all must have been the result of many supernovae, and an enormous amount of time to form these celestial objects. Scientists believe that this is indeed how Earth came to be. Approximately 4.6 billion years ago, our solar system was nothing but a cloud of dust and gas, which we can now assume was the result of a supernova. Over time, the weight of its gravity caused the material to collapse in on itself, forming our sun in the centre. The leftover material began to bind as small particles drew together under the force of gravity and formed larger particles. Lighter elements such as hydrogen and helium were swept away by solar winds, while heavier rocky materials were left behind to form relatively small terrestrial planets, like Earth. Further from the core, Solar winds didn't have the same impact on lighter elements, which allowed these light elements to form gas giants like Jupiter and Saturn, called gas giants because they are mostly comprised of gases surrounding a solid core. In Earth's case, its rocky core was first formed by the heavier elements binding together, while the lighter elements collected around the more dense core to form its crust and gases that make up our protective atmosphere were captured by Earth's gravity. Early in Earth's history, it thankfully suffered a number of collisions, at least one of which sent pieces of our young planet's mantle flying outward. These pieces of Earth would eventually bind together by the force of gravity to form our moon, which then began to orbit Earth. A number of other collisions with Earth from frozen masses of dust and gas would deposit much of Earth's surface water. Being that the Earth, thankfully, lies in the Goldilocks zone, our water neither freezes nor evaporates. This led to the possibility of the development of life and we now know that none of it would have been possible if it hadn't have been for a star collapsing in on itself, causing a supernova billions of years ago. 
While many aspects of the relationship between star formation, supernovae and molecular clouds are still hotly debated within the scientific community, and there is still so much to learn, this new data from Gaia that helped create the 3D maps of molecular clouds which allowed scientists to discover the huge void in space between Perseus and Taurus has aided spectacularly in expanding our understanding of the process. In time, it's possible we'll discover more of these voids, and who knows, maybe on the surface of another void will lie a star like our sun, which may have some similarly terrestrial planet in its Goldilocks zone where life can exist. I certainly hope so, and if such a discovery ever comes, we'll have a supernova to thank for it. Are the stars in the night sky already dead? It's a good question, and the simple answer is, maybe, maybe not. That covers just about every possibility. The question is, in fact, fascinating, because it concerns concepts of simultaneity, space-time, and the maximum speed at which information can travel. We can take the question to mean, how can stars shine if they no longer exist? Well, it depends on when and where you are. These concepts, when and where, are the same things in space-time and light years. Let's take Betelgez, for example. Betelgez is a red giant, about 600 light years away, which is pretty close by astronomical standards. It's sometimes called Alpha Orionis, since it's the brightest star in the constellation Orion. But pretty close still means that what we see of Betelgez is 600 years old, since that's how long light takes to get to here from there. And light, whether visible or radio, or any other wavelength, can only travel at a maximum of 186,000 miles per second or 300,000 kilometers per second. Betelgeuse seems to be dimming as we see it now, which has made astronomers pretty excited. This is because it may be about to explode, because red giants after they burn through their lighter elements, typically contract and then expand explosively. We're all waiting to see if this happens, but the dimming we see happened 600 years ago in our frame of reference. Likewise with the star KIC 8462852, or Tabitha's star, is also dimming, but on the whole, in a progressive fashion, with some intervals of temporary brightening. This star is 1,480 light years away, so whatever we see happening there actually happened at least 1,480 years ago, by our frame of reference. We really don't understand what's going on there either, although we do have some ideas. Talking to a Mars rover takes 7 to 11 minutes, depending on where Mars is in its orbit. If our own star, the Sun, exploded, the blast wouldn't hit us for about 9 minutes after it really happened. The point is that nothing in the universe is happening as we see it, when we see it, because of the built-in and unavoidable lag time caused by the upper limit of the speed of light, and electromagnetic radiation in general. No matter where we look in the universe, we are actually seeing the past. For example, the galaxy GNZ11 has been measured as 13.4 billion light years away, which means that it somehow formed, and how this could be remains a mystery, only 400 million years after the universe began. Astronomers have been studying a giant, super hot blue star in a galaxy 75 million light years away, a star millions of times brighter than our own sun, and then one day, it was gone. How did this happen? We don't know, and of course, it's too far away to see in terms of visible, optical light, so we use spectral analysis of its wavelengths. But it's just not there anymore, and no one knows why. There was no explosion, no supernova, no nothing. But whatever it was, it happened 75 million years ago. Astronomers theorise that a predictive phenomenon may have happened, which is that this giant hot star simply fizzled out into a black hole without any of the anticipated excitement. In other words, it just vanished. We are psychologically predispositioned, even conditioned, to regard events as occurring at the moment we observe them, because all organisms are shaped by adaption for survival. This is generally a wise policy, because even if a predator launches an attack on you, several fractions of a second before you see it, knowing this is no help at all. So it gets confusing when we try to process the idea that we hear or see something several seconds or minutes after the sound or event occurred, but that's what happens. Sound, of course, isn't electromagnetic radiation. It's much slower, and still involves a lag time. 
The events we see or hear in the night sky, in the form of optical images, or radio, or gamma rays, or x-rays, are from so far away that we have to start thinking in terms of hundreds, thousands, millions, or billions of light years away, and a corresponding number of years in the past. This is because there is really no such thing as simultaneity. In the sense of two or more things, whatever they may be, happening at exactly the same time. And this is because of relativity, and the upper limit of the speed at which information can travel. When we talk or think of simultaneity, or at the same time, we are really talking about what is called an absolute Cartesian coordinate system, where everything is referenced to one point. And this works, in a rough way, if we're talking about short distances and intervals of time. Greenwich Mean Time GMT, works pretty well, because there is very little lag time between events referenced in it. Time zones are actually a different idea, and are not pertinent to this. But for an event to even happen, there has to be some sort of consequence. Essentially just the transfer of information, and this is limited by the maximum speed of electromagnetic radiation. There is no absolute time, because this would require some sort of universal clock that everything in the universe detects at the same time, and this cannot happen. The only knowledge we have of the universe is what reaches us, and this takes time. You can see the problem here, the cap on the speed of EMR, and there is no getting around it, because mass increases as speed increases, and there is no getting around that either. At the speed of light, mass becomes infinite. As a result, there really can't be anything like simultaneity, or any sense of, at the same time, because there is no absolute zero point of reference. We can talk about an event that, from our point of view, happened a hundred, or thousands, or a million, or a billion years ago, but that's just what we see now. So with all this in mind, are the stars we see actually dead? As we said at the beginning, maybe some of them are, but we won't know until we've received that information, and there is no way of us knowing until that happens. It is not like we are somehow able to experience real time, because all we are doing is experiencing time as it passes in our own frame of reference. Somewhere else in the universe, any events will have happened at some other time, determined by the speed of light. There is no one absolute time, and so no simultaneity. So from our perspective, some of the stars we see may well be obliterated, and what we see is what it used to be many years ago. So to answer the age-old question, the answer is that it is very possible that some of the stars we see are no longer there anymore from their own frame of reference. So next time you're looking up at the night sky, you really could be looking at a star that died many years ago an ever-reassuring thought that the universe is an exceedingly strange place, and we've only just begun to scratch its surface. The night sky is filled with stars as far as the eye can see. From our perspective on Earth, they might seem just tiny specks of light, but all of them are different, unique. Stars have many colours, sizes, temperatures and radiance. They can range from smaller than some planets, to bigger than Saturn's orbit. They can shine in different colours. Some live just a few million years, others might last way longer than the current age of the universe. Some die with a whimper, others with a bang. Astronomers have been observing and cataloguing stars for millennia, and the 20th century saw the construction of massive telescopes to study them. We know a lot more about how stars work today than we did a few generations ago. Enough to understand how they form, how they live and how they die. Not all stars are created equal, and in fact, they are so distinct that each type will warrant a video on their own. But today we'll explore the basics of a star, what goes on inside them, and some of the types out there. Get ready to dive into some of the most extreme and weird environments in the universe. This is the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, one of the primary ways astronomers classify stars. It compares them based on luminosity and surface temperature. Hotter stars are bluish, while colder ones have redder colours. Our Sun is right in the middle, being known as the Yellow Dwarf, more specifically, a G2V type star. A typical star like our Sun spends most of its life in the main sequence. Main sequence stars are giant balls of hydrogen squeezed so tight by their own gravity that the pressure on their cores is enough to fuse said hydrogen into heavier elements. This nuclear fusion process is exothermic, which means it releases energy. 
It's what powers the star and counteracts gravity's pressure on the core from just collapsing into nothingness. Stars live constantly, in this fragile balance between the crushing pressure of gravity and the outwards pressure of nuclear fusion, and it's their overall mass that determines everything about them. The more mass a star has, the more pressure its core will be put under by that mass. To counteract the increased gravity and maintain balance, more massive stars have to burn hotter, which makes them spend more energy and ultimately burn faster. That's why larger stars live shorter lives. They simply run out of fuel before their smaller stellar cousins, even though they have more of it. A star twice as massive as our Sun, like Sirius A, the brightest star in the night sky, has the surface temperature of almost double, at 9,940 Kelvin, and it shines 25 times brighter. All that increased energy output makes Sirius A spend its nuclear fuel a lot faster, its lifespan being just about a quarter of the Sun's. Stars more massive than that can have a surface temperature of more than 20,000 Kelvin and will live for just a few million years. But running out of hydrogen doesn't always mean the end. For a lot of stars, it's just a transition into a new phase. As the star gets older and its supply of hydrogen in the core runs out, the outwards pressure of hydrogen fusion ceases, and it can no longer hold the grip of gravity at bay. The star is no longer in equilibrium, and begins to collapse on itself. If it has enough mass, however, this further increase in pressure can eventually heat up its core and surrounding layers to high enough temperatures, allowing fusion to begin once more. First, as the star gets smaller, a thin shell outside the dead core becomes hot enough to fuse hydrogen for the first time Meanwhile, the core, although unable to fuse helium just yet, continues to generate energy by gravitational contraction. These processes are more intense than during core hydrogen fusion of the main sequence phase, generating extra outwards pressure and causing the star's outer layers to swell by several times. The star has officially left the main sequence and moved into red giant territory. It is now dying. Red giants are bigger, but not more massive than they were as main sequence stars. As stated, their increase in volume is due to the larger outwards pressure of a hotter core and surrounding layers. Our Sun, for example, will have similar mass as a red giant compared to what it has today, but will be able to grow to more than 100 times its current size. Besides the size, another significant side effect of this stage is a colder surface as the star's outer layers are less dense and further away from the heat of the core. That usually turns them red, as red light has less energy than blue or white. At some point, the shrinking core will reach approximately 100 million Kelvin, starting helium fusion. The star will get a little smaller as density and temperature increase, but it will still remain several times larger than its main sequence version. Yet those changes aren't a salvation as much as a delay. Both hydrogen shell fusion and helium core fusion require a lot more heat to burn than the original main sequence nuclear fusion, and this means they'll burn much faster. A star like our Sun lives 10 billion years in the main sequence, but only 1 billion as a red giant. Once all the helium in its core has been fused into carbon and oxygen, the star will contract once more. This will eventually create another shell fusion phase, this time as a helium shell outside the core becomes hot enough to fuse further swelling the star's outer layers. And that's where the sun stops. It'll spend around a billion years in this red giant stage, but when helium shell fusion is finished, it won't have enough mass left to burn further elements. It'll begin collapsing again, irreversibly this time, and shed its outer layers, ultimately turning into a dim white dwarf. A cold stellar corpse held together by electron degenerate matter, slowly losing its remaining heat to space. But some can go further. More massive stars create enough pressure to keep heating up their cores and fusing heavier and heavier elements in faster shell core fusion cycles, until they get to iron, that is. Due to its atomic makeup, iron is extremely stable and unlike the elements that came before it, fusing it is an endothermic process, which means it consumes energy instead of releasing it. When a stellar core reaches iron, there's no going further. It can't be fused, and even electron pressure can't save the star now, 
The iron core violently and instantly shrinks from the size of a planet to a mere few kilometers as the layers surrounding it follow suit. The implosion of these outer layers rebounds out of the core, producing a supernova, an explosion so bright it outshines an entire galaxy. What's left of the star is either a neutron star or a black hole, depending on the core's mass. Less than 5% of stars are massive enough to end in a supernova, and even middle-sized stars, like our Sun, account for less than 30% of the overall number of stars. At the polar opposite of size, mass, and violence, there's another type of star that's more abundant than any other. Red dwarfs. And they have their quirks too. Red dwarfs are a special type of main sequence star. They are the smallest stars and that makes them extremely abundant and long-lasting. Astronomers estimate red dwarfs amount to 70% of all the stars in the universe and can live for trillions of years, which means not a single one has burned out since the universe began. They will outshine our sun and all the other stars along with it. Unlike their bigger cousins that accumulate all their helium in their core due to the increased gravity, red dwarfs are fully connective. That means their helium and hydrogen are constantly mixing, reducing pressure and slowing down the rate at which they burn their fuel. Unfortunately, even small, dim and extremely efficient stars like red dwarfs must one day die too, and their deaths will be unlike anything else. A red dwarf won't have a shell fusion phase. The star will simply continue to burn all of its hydrogen until there's none left, and when fusion ceases, there won't be enough mass to even ignite helium fusion in its core. Instead of going through a red giant phase, it'll just quietly increase its surface temperature, radiating energy faster in order to maintain equilibrium. This last stage in a red dwarf's life is called blue dwarf, because its colour will change as the surface temperature increases. Since red dwarfs live for trillions of years, astronomers estimate there are currently no blue dwarfs in the universe. In the end, it'll turn into a white dwarf, but not through a violent process like our sun. Due to their abundance and lifespan, red dwarfs are the most likely candidates for humanity's future home after our sun inevitably dies. Yet they aren't without their perils, and colonising a red dwarf system will have a number of new challenges our civilization will have to overcome. But that's a subject for a future video. There are many types of stars, and even the same one can look vastly different depending on how far along it is in its lifespan, which makes them hard to study and classify. We hope to have provided here a simple and interesting introduction to their properties, and we'll come back in the future to dive deeper into each one, as well as explaining objects like neutron stars and white dwarfs that may look like regular stars but behave in totally distinct manners. When we look at the stars in the night sky, we may think they're all the same. The truth, however, is exactly the opposite. Thanks for joining us this week in Access Astronomy. We hope to see you here next week as we continue to explore our strange and vast universe. We often think of our solar system as mostly empty space, populated by a few planets millions upon millions of kilometres apart, with some asteroids and comets sprinkled in between. But in reality, our home in space is a far more dynamic place than that. The Sun, as a giant nuclear fusion reactor, is constantly blasting the whole solar system with charged particles. Astronomers call this solar wind, and it comes from the Sun's corona, the uppermost atmosphere of the star. This plasma mostly consists of electrons, protons and alpha particles, which are highly energetic and small enough to be able to damage molecules like our DNA, hitting our bodies like tiny subatomic bullets. We already touched in a previous video upon the concept of the heliosphere, the region of space where our sun's charged particles exert their influence. Today, we are going to dive further into what protects us from its dangers, the magnetic field. To explain magnetic fields, we first have to talk about where they come from. In physics, there are four fundamental forces and pillars of the rules of our universe. The strong force, the weak force, gravity and electromagnetism. The strong force keeps atoms nuclei together. The weak force governs radioactive decay. Gravity deals with mass interactions. And lastly, electromagnetism is all about charges. At the individual level, 
Protons have a positive charge, and electrons have a negative. They usually balance themselves inside an atom, the most stable ones having the same number of protons and electrons. However, while protons are tightly packed inside the atom's core, electrons orbit in a sea of probability around it. The way they do so is by filling stable layers around the nucleus. If a layer isn't filled, however, the atom becomes reactive. It's electrons on the outermost layer, called valence electrons, being able to interact with others in other atoms. Different atoms can share with, or even give electrons to each other, in order to fill these outer layers, thus forming chemical bonds. With sufficient energy or through specific patterns, it is possible to even remove electrons from these outer layers entirely, making the atoms ionized. Those electrons are now free to move and create a current. That's electromagnetism. In layman's terms, a magnetic field is nothing more than a field that passes through space and which makes a magnetic force move electric charges and magnetic dipoles. It is a form of interaction with the electromagnetic force. By having positively and negatively charged regions, it can create a flow of electrons following those differences in potential. From a tiny fridge magnet to our entire planet's magnetosphere, the physics remains the same. Our planet has many layers, and deep inside among them is our liquid metal outer core, with heat left over from Earth's very creation. Due to the extremely high temperatures and pressure, the iron in the outer core is able to exist in liquid form, with lots of free electrons to make it extremely conductive. With help from Earth's rotation and interactions within itself, this fluid is able to move in currents, creating what's called a dynamo effect. This movement is what creates our planet's magnetic field. It streams electrons from the core into far beyond the atmosphere and back again, basically turning the planet into a giant magnet. But beyond helping travellers all over history find their way with a compass, Earth's magnetosphere serves a far more important job, protecting the surface from high energy particles like cosmic rays and the solar wind by trapping and accelerating these particles to the poles. There they collide with gases in the upper atmosphere, creating beautiful auroras. Without this protection, the sheer strength of these high energy particles would strip material from all over our atmosphere, essentially blowing it away into space. Astronomers long hypothesized this to have happened in other planets in our solar system, like Mars, that show signs of once being habitable, but losing that stability once its core solidified. Mars has all the hallmarks of a previously habitable planet. Long valleys caused by erosion, evidence of an ancient, much more dense atmosphere, to be able to sustain water in liquid form. However, astronomers believe once this geological activity subsided and the core froze, the planet lost its magnetic field, the only shield protecting it from the harmful solar wind. Over millennia, the Sun then proceeded to strip Mars of almost all of its atmosphere decreasing the pressure so much that the oceans eventually simply evaporated into space, leaving behind a barren, cold and irradiated wasteland that was no longer capable of sustaining life. The moment it ceased to have a magnetosphere, Mars's habitable days were numbered, and since Mars missions would take a lot further and longer to complete, future astronauts or colonies on the Red Planet will have to work around this lack of protection, likely building underground or coating structures with a layer of soil so the ground can absorb some of that extremely harmful radiation. One way we can minimise that in the near future would be to create a magnet and deploy it some distance in front of the planet, thus creating the effects of a proper magnetic field and once again shielding Mars from the solar wind. That, plus freeing gases from the planet's poles, and we might even be able to begin terraforming it. But if our close red neighbour is plagued with a lack of magnetic field, the next planet over is the complete opposite. Jupiter's magnetic field is about 20 times stronger than Earth's, and its magnetosphere is 20,000 times larger. It extends up to 7 million kilometres in the Sun's direction, and almost to the orbit of Saturn in the opposite direction, making it the largest and most powerful of any planetary magnetosphere in the solar system, and by volume the largest known continuous structure in the solar system, after the heliosphere. It's so powerful in fact, 
that our probes have to actively avoid it, purposely having highly elliptical and polar orbits to spend as much time away from it as possible. And while our planet's magnetic field is created by molten iron, Jupiter is so massive that the pressure in its core can compress even hydrogen into a metallic liquid, making it extremely conductive. The magnetic currents being so strong that the planet has a permanent aurora in its poles. All this strength could also cause problems for future manned missions, as the particles trapped by Jupiter's powerful magnetic field produce intense belts of radiation, similar to Earth's Van Allen belts, but thousands of times stronger. This radiation interacts with the surfaces of Jupiter's largest moons, and markedly affects their chemical and physical properties. Those same particles also affect and are affected by the motions of the particles within Jupiter's tenuous planetary ring system. If humans want to visit the Jovian system, they'll have to develop new technologies capable of withstanding this hazardous environment, a far more daunting task than the ones to be able to visit Mars. Even incomprehensible giants like Jupiter are just a drop in the bucket of the cosmic ocean. Once we move from planets to stars, it's a whole different scale. Let's take the heliosphere as an example, which extends far beyond the orbits of all planets in our solar system, and took Voyager 1 almost 35 years travelling at more than 60,000 km per hour to escape. It's created by the Sun's magnetic field, plus the solar wind, and it's more than 850 times larger than Jupiter's magnetosphere. It's what simultaneously protects us from the majority of interstellar cosmic rays, and is also strong enough to strip planets of their atmospheres, requiring them to have their own magnetic fields. Our Sun, however, is a calm and small star. In astronomy it belongs in the G-type main sequence class, commonly referred to as yellow dwarfs. Its influence can only be felt a mere 18 million kilometres from it, Massive, more dense stars can have magnetic fields several times stronger. But curiously, the crown of the most insane magnetic field in the universe goes to not a living star, but a dying one. Neutron stars are weird objects that combine relativity with quantum mechanics just by existing, and we'll definitely dive deeper into their story and composition in a later video. But for now it's sufficient to say, their magnetic fields range from millions to even trillions of times stronger than the Sun that's strong enough to erase a credit card from the distance of the Earth to the Moon. These extreme magnetic fields are produced by the mind-boggling amounts of pressure a neutron star is put under, as well as its quick rotation, ranging from once in a couple dozen seconds to several thousand times per second. If a neutron star would be any more extreme, it would turn into a black hole. And then it would behave completely differently, breaking several laws of known physics in the process but that is a subject for another day. From tiny to interstellar, from harmless to hazardous, magnetic fields are an integral part of stellar and planetary development. Without one on our planet, it's safe to say we certainly wouldn't be here to learn about them. And as like everything else in the universe, they aren't as simple as they might seem at first glance. In physics, there are four fundamental forces that govern the entire cosmos. The strong force, carried by particles known as gluons, binds quarks together to make protons and neutrons. The weak force, carried by W and Z bosons, rules radioactive decay, the process in which atoms can turn into others and irradiate nuclear energy. Gravity, still somewhat of a mystery to quantum mechanics, works with mass and dominates interplanetary scales. The last, and perhaps the most vital for the study of astronomy, and even life on Earth, is electromagnetism. Carried by the photons, it's responsible for radio, X-rays, the heat of our sun, and most important, all the light in the universe. We mentioned electromagnetism before in a previous episode, while talking about magnetic fields. Now it's time to explore it more thoroughly talk about the many forms this energy can be perceived and its uses. In other words, let's talk about the electromagnetic spectrum. Light is a wave of alternating electric and magnetic fields, most of it completely invisible to us. The more energy the wave has, the higher its frequency, which is the same as saying it has a shorter wavelength. 
The electromagnetic spectrum is the whole range of energy states light can have, from as faint as the cosmic microwave background to as powerful as the strongest supernova. Photons can transmit information, heat, colours and much more. Think about waves in the ocean or sound propagating through air. The faster these waves are, the higher their frequency. Conversely, as they get more frequent, they have to shorten their length to occupy the same space. If you want to say more words in the same amount of time, you've got to talk faster and spend more energy to do it. Light behaves pretty much the same way. The more energy a photon has, the higher its frequency and shorter its wavelength. This is important because different materials can absorb or reflect different wavelengths of light. A green leaf, for example, absorbs all the visible light from the sun except the green frequency, which it reflects back, making it the only one to enter our eyes. But the light we can see makes just a tiny portion of the larger EM spectrum, with wavelengths ranging from as large as the entire Earth to as small as an atomic nuclei. Because of this large range, the properties of light can vary drastically based on wavelength. Let's explain a little about each of them. The less energetic type of electromagnetic radiation are radio waves. Their wavelengths are large, making them perfect for long distance propagation. Radio waves have the ability to pass through the atmosphere, foliage and most building materials and by diffraction can bend around obstructions. Unlike other electromagnetic waves, they tend to be scattered rather than absorbed by objects larger than their wavelength. Using those properties, combined with their low energy, it's relatively easy to create and maintain radio signals, making them perfect for communication. Radio and TV signals, maritime navigation, cell phone towers, all of those work using mostly radio waves. Right beside these are microwaves, also used in communication, mainly satellite and radar. In astronomy, radio and microwave telescopes can detect faint and distant signals from the furthest corners of space. Like the cosmic wave background, an imprint of the recombination epoch, the moment when charged electrons and protons first became able to form electrically neutral hydrogen atoms. The CMB is known as the oldest light in the universe. Since before recombination, the universe was mostly plasma, too hot and dense for photons to move freely, essentially opaque. When it expanded just enough for the temperature to drop under 3000 K, electrons and nuclei first joined together, leaving photons to finally roam free. This is the moment the universe became transparent. However, this expansion doesn't stop. In all those billions years since then, it has enlarged so much that photons from the CMB got their wavelengths stretched more and more until they fell into radio waves. So the only way to detect them, as well as many other astronomical phenomena, such as pulsar orbital periods, quasar emissions, and even merging galaxy clusters, is through radio and microwave astronomy. But information isn't the only thing light can carry. Microwaves are known for their heating properties thanks to microwave ovens, which use millimetre wavelengths to heat up water molecules in food. However, all wavelengths of light carry energy in the form of heat. Perhaps the EM range most famously associated with heat might be the infrared light, due to almost all blackbody radiation emitted by objects in a room temperature being in those wavelengths. That's why most thermal imaging cameras work within the infrared, because inside Earth's atmosphere, heat might as well be synonymous with infrared radiation. In astronomy, infrared is used to study our sun. Most of its energy comes in this part of the spectrum. 527 watts in infrared radiation versus 445 watts in visible light. Infrared telescopes can also help with visible light observations by detecting previously visible wavelengths stretched into infrared by the universe's expansion. That will be one of the main missions of the James Webb Space Telescope, which hopes to launch this year and will operate in the near infrared spectra. The easiest part of the EM spectrum, for most of us to understand, is the visible spectrum, going from 400 to about 800 terahertz. 
This is all of the universe we can actually see with our own eyes. This is what the cells in our retinas can pick up, and our brains interpret as light. Different colours have specific ranges inside the larger visible spectrum, and white light is the sum of all of them. This is the moon in the night sky, the blue oceans on the beach, the green leaves in the forest, your favourite colour, the face of the person you love, the movie you really like, everything you'll ever see in your entire life, less than a tenth of a tenth of a percent of the EM spectrum. Fortunately, humans are smart, and have developed technology to see far beyond what our eyes can, and going beyond visible light only makes the universe stranger and more dangerous. After violet, the colour of visible light with the highest frequency, there's the aptly named ultraviolet light, mostly invisible to us outside black lights. Some UV photons have enough energy to break chemical bonds, causing ionisation, a process in which electrons break away from atoms that is extremely harmful to living organisms because it damages DNA and can lead to cancer. In these wavelengths, our sun turns from hero to villain, being the major source of all UV light that reaches our planet. If you get skin cancer, it's probably the sun's fault. Lucky for us, only 10% of sunlight is in the ultraviolet range, and the Earth's atmosphere absorbs most of UV and higher frequencies, giving life essential protection against harmful radiation coming from our sun and other cosmic sources. UV light also has a number of uses, from lasers to disinfection, and even photography. It's even responsible for the formation of vitamin D in most land vertebrates including humans, thus being both beneficial and harmful to life. In astronomy, it's often used to penetrate some types of clouds and observe objects as close as auroras in Jupiter's atmosphere or star formations in other galaxies. After UV we find X-rays, known for being able to penetrate relatively thick objects without being much absorbed or scattered. Their wavelengths are usually just short enough to pass through molecules, and that's why they're greatly used in radiography, becoming almost synonymous with it. Due to Earth's atmosphere absorbing such short wavelengths, instruments to detect X-rays must be taken to high altitude by balloons, sounding rockets and satellites. X-ray telescopes can see past most interstellar dust from nebulae and into high energetic space phenomena like neutron stars, accretion disks and even the Milky Way's extremely busy galactic centre. The champion for most energetic electromagnetic radiation, however, goes to gamma rays. Created by the radioactive decay of atomic nuclei, it's the shortest wavelength a photon can reach. They come from nuclear explosions on Earth, and supernova or neutron star collisions in space. Gamma rays have wavelengths so small that not even a mirror can reflect them, the photons passing between the atoms without any problem. For that exact reason, protection against gamma rays is extremely difficult. Although our atmosphere would filter most of it, a direct hit from a source as far as 4,000 light years away could strip the Earth of almost all of its ozone layer, causing a mass extinction. In fact, a gamma ray burst is one of the suggested explanations given by scientists for the Ordovician extinction that killed more than 85% of marine life about 450 million years ago. Fortunately, our galaxy has a diameter of more than 100,000 light years, and about only one gamma ray burst per millennia so extinction by a giant black hole laser isn't something we should be worried about just now. We don't often correlate light with radio, satellite or x-rays, but they are all part of the same thing. That just goes to show how something as trivial as light can take a whole larger meaning in astronomy. Photons really are the unsung heroes of the universe. Enceladus, a moon of Saturn and the largest known moon in our solar system, has been described as the strangest place we know. This is to some degree a matter of individual opinion, but even so, Enceladus is in fact a very special place, particularly with regard to the search for extraterrestrial life. Enceladus is one of the so-called icy moons of our solar system, orbiting Saturn along with Titan and the Jovian moons Europa, Ganymede and Callisto. They are all classed as water worlds, in that all five are thought to harbour subsurface oceans that could, to varying degrees, potentially host some kind of life. Triton the largest of Neptune's 13 moons, is sometimes included, and is relatively large as moons go, but it is so poorly studied, and so far away at 2.7 billion miles, that it is usually left out of any practical discussion of exploration, at least for the moment. 
Titan, a moon of Saturn, has a surface with methane and ethane, lakes and rivers, rocks and mountains, made of water ice, and evaporation, clouds and precipitation. In other words, a hydrological cycle, involving these hydrocarbons. This is attractive in itself, because it looks very much like Earth, except that the average surface temperature on Titan is, is 290 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. But it is hypothesized that Titan has an extensive, relatively warm subsurface of ocean water. All of these moons are very attractive targets for exploration, especially concerning exobiology. But Enceladus is especially so because of its tiger stripes. Enceladus is the sixth largest moon of Saturn, which doesn't sound impressive until you remember that Saturn has 83 moons. It is still rather tiny though, only one tenth the size of Titan, and only one seventh the size of the Earth's moon. But unlike dead moons, Enceladus, although it has been pounded by asteroids, as has every other body in our solar system, has a surface that seems to be relatively fresh and unmarked, at least at its southern pole. This is because it has been continuously resurfaced, why and how is that? Unlike the other icy moons in our solar system, we can get a glimpse of what is underneath the ice crust of Enceladus, which typically ranges from 11 miles to 13.7 miles thick, but maybe only 3 miles thick at the South Pole. Drilling through 3 miles of ice on an alien moon, 790 million miles away may not sound like anything resembling a realistic plan, but there is a bonus with Enceladus that wasn't really expected until the first flybys of the Cassini probe in 2005. Cassini completed 22 flybys of Enceladus by 2015, before a planned self-destruction into Saturn in 2017 in order to prevent contamination of potentially habitable moons. One of the last images from Cassini was of Enceladus, as the spacecraft headed towards Saturn's atmosphere. The data from these flybys are still being analysed, but one of the striking discoveries was made immediately which is that Enceladus is periodically spewing jets and curtains or sheets of its subsurface ocean from its south pole into space. Enceladus orbits in the densest part of Saturn's E-ring, the second most outer ring of the ring system, and material from Enceladus's spewing of material is the source of that ring. These jets and curtains of water and organic molecules are coming from the tiger stripes. What are they? Why are they there? And what do they reveal about the interior of Enceladus? These are four stripe-like cracks in the ice crust that occur at the south pole of Enceladus, nearly 181 miles long, and pretty evenly spaced at nearly 22 miles apart. They even have names, Damascus, Baghdad, Cairo, and Alexandria, after the 1001 Arabian Nights epic collection of stories. At least along some extensive portions of their lengths, these cracks extend all the way down to Enceladus's subsurface ocean, and emit material from this ocean, a bit like drilling in reverse. These cracks or tiger stripes seem to be unique to Enceladus, and they are only at the South Pole. The ice is significantly thinner at the poles than it is at lower latitudes, and the nature of Enceladus's orbit around Saturn and its gravitational interaction with the moon Dione produce gravitational stresses and heat. At the poles, these stresses can produce cracks where the ice crust is thinnest. This could have occurred at either poles, and just happened to occur at the South. These cracks open and close, depending on where in its orbit Enceladus is, hence the periodic emissions of water and other substances. And so, with these geysers and curtains of water and ice particles, we've already been able to glimpse what may lie below. The data from Cassini are large, and are still being analysed long after the craft itself plunged into Saturn. It is all very interesting. Enceladus should be frozen solid. It is so small that it would fit between Los Angeles and San Francisco. And the Saturnian system is so far away that it gets barely one one hundredth of the energy from the Sun that the Earth receives. But it is not frozen solid, and this was a major revelation. There is a heat source from somewhere. Heat means chemical reactions and chemical reactions can possibly allow biology of some kind. Cassini, after releasing the Huygens lander to Titan, made 22 passes by Enceladus. 
sometimes as close as 16 miles from the surface. It also passed through emissions from the Tiger Stripes three times, and it found some very interesting things. All this is still being analysed, but there are some firm results. The water jets and curtains contain salt water, silica grains, molecular hydrogen, and organic molecules. This tells us that the subsurface ocean is salty, and that Enceladus has a permeable, rocky core, and that the temperature at the core exceeds 200 degrees Fahrenheit, or 90 degrees Celsius. Since heat from gravitational stress isn't likely to account for such a high temperature, it is very likely that there are hydrothermal vents in the core, somewhat like the hydrothermal vents in Earth's oceans. The chemistry going on down there, at the bottom of a six mile deep ocean, is very important because hydrogen and organic molecules, like carbon dioxide, are metabolised by terrestrial microbes at hydrothermal vents for energy. In addition, the latest analysis from Cassini's Cosmic Dust Analyzer, or CDA, as reported in the October 2nd, 2019 issue of Monthly Notices of the Royal Astronomical Society, has revealed that molecular precursors of amino acids have been found in Enceladus' cryovolcanic plumes and curtains from the tiger stripes. They have to be coming from the bottom of that ocean. This really is anyone's guess. Certainly, there will be extraterrestrial geology, because geology is just physics in action, and happens everywhere. We have to remember that the whole point of exploration is to learn and understand things for their own sakes, not necessarily ours. We want to know the fundamental workings of the universe. There is a lot going on under the surface, and also on the surface of Enceladus. We'll almost certainly find hydrothermal vents, like the white and black smokers we have discovered at the bottoms of our own oceans. Beyond that, what we also really and obviously want to know is if there is any kind of life down there. However simple it may be doesn't matter. What matters is if there is anything we could call life down there in those deep, dark depths. After all, our own deep sea vents are loaded with life. And this is all made possible by that metabolic cycle that involves hydrogen and an energy source. We know that amino acid precursors are there. We know that water is there. We know that a source of energy is there. We know that once life gets started, it can and will adapt to an astonishing range of conditions. But it has to get started, and this is something we don't quite yet understand, although we are getting very close. We really need to understand what is happening on Enceladus. After decades of concentrating on planets, we've expanded our exploration of our solar system to the dwarf planets like Pluto and Ceres, and the moons of our major planets. The exploration of these moons, aside from the basic scientific curiosity, has been driven partially by the question we all ask, is there life out there? This is also a source of our focus on Mars, along with the idea that Mars may provide a safe haven in the event that we really mess up Earth. For many years, Mars seemed our best bet for finding life elsewhere in our solar system, with the obvious risk that if we find it there, it will be from terrestrial contamination. Mars is so close that Mars and Earth have certainly traded pieces of themselves for billions of years. The outer planets of our solar system don't really have that problem, but their problem is that Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune are gigantic and composed largely of volatile gases with a small core under crushing pressures. Life may not be impossible on one or more of them, but it is hard to imagine what life will look like, let alone how to detect it. We began to realise that perhaps the moons of these gas giants might actually be better analogues for Earth, and so we began paying more attention to them. We also discovered, in the meantime, that water isn't rare at all in our solar system. And then we discovered that there are many moons out there that are very unlike our own moon, but in fact have lots of liquid water, oceans of it in fact. Europa became a prime target. It still is, especially since observations from the Kepler Space Telescope have suggested that it too may periodically spew thick plumes of water from under its ice crust. But in general, that crust is between 40 miles and 100 miles thick, so getting through will be a very tough engineering task. But its surface is crisscrossed, with fractures, and looks fairly recent in geological terms, which means that the ice crust is being recycled continuously. This, in turn, means that Europa is active in some way, and Europa is distorting Jupiter's magnetic field by its own magnetosphere, 
which seems to be caused by some conductive fluid that is likely to be water. An energy source has not been discovered, however. But Enceladus is a kind of astronomical and exobiologist paid it. It's farther away, but it's definitely spitting its subsurface ocean, and whatever it contains, out in space. And the tiger stripes are, practically speaking, permanent. So we can visit them, and sample their emissions. The tiger stripes of Enceladus, and whatever is underneath them, are now our main target. They are right there, waiting for us. At first appearance, this sounds like a pretty far-fetched idea. Does space exploration really damage Earth's ozone layer? After all, the Earth's atmosphere is by our scale, fairly large and complex, but our rockets are small. So how could space exploration itself significantly damage our ozone layer? Well, as it turns out, this may be possible, at least in the near future, and it is a very complicated issue. Space exploration always leaves behind a lot of debris, some of which we never before considered. This is not surprising, because increasing technological sophistication is typically more complex than we can anticipate. Once upon a time, we didn't know what carbon dioxide could do to our environment, but now we do. We didn't know what methane, chlorofluorocarbons, or burning fossil fuels could do to our environment, but now we do. Space travel has really just begun for humanity, and it has accelerated rapidly. Many countries, including some considered developing, now send satellites into orbit, or on exploratory missions, and after that, if they return to Earth, they are generally allowed to disintegrate in our atmosphere upon re-entry. But these launches and re-entries leave residue, because technology is very messy, and except in the weird quantum world, nothing is either created or destroyed. The world of quantum physics, with its virtual particles and quantum foam, is rather different from the world we think we know. Technology always has consequences, and just as we had no idea what burning fossil fuels would do over the long term, we still have little or no idea of what launching rockets do to our atmosphere. There are ongoing plans to make spaceflight commercial. This means frequent launches and re-entries. We need to know what this may do to the environment. The central question is, do rocket launches of any type, not just for the purpose of space exploration, but for any purpose, damage the atmosphere or our environment in general? Let's take a brief look. The ozone layer is what prevents us, and all life on Earth, from being fried by ultraviolet radiation from the Sun. The ozone layer is a stratum of our stratosphere that exists from heights of 8 to 10 miles to 25 to 30 miles above the surface, 13 to 16 or 40 to 48 kilometers, with some variation. Ozone, or O3, is a gas composed of trioxygen, a form of molecular oxygen, consisting of three atoms of oxygen. It occurs throughout our atmosphere, from the troposphere, meaning ground level, to the stratosphere. Although it is a poisonous gas, it is protective to life on Earth, because in the stratosphere, it absorbs several wavelengths of ultraviolet light, and without it, the surface of the Earth would be sterilized. This is why the hole in the ozone layer, first discovered in 1982, caused alarm. When it became apparent that the hole was growing, and probably due to the escape of chlorofluorocarbons, known as CFCs, and hydrofluorocarbons, known as HFCs, both widely used in industry and manufacturing. It took only one meeting day in 1987 for the entire political world to unanimously approve the Montreal Protocol, limiting and eventually eliminating ozone-depleting substances. This protocol was based on an agreement made several years earlier in Vienna. The good news is the whole size is reducing and is on track to completely repair itself, providing no further damage is caused. The damage from these launches are still negligible at the moment, but will inevitably get worse if attempts at mitigation aren't taken seriously and pursued. Briefly, ozone or O3 is fairly unstable and reactive. In particular, UV radiation splits ozone molecules into what is narrowly and technically considered molecular oxygen, or O2, and atomic oxygen, or O. These normally recombine, however, chlorine and bromine, both present in rocket exhaust, will capture the atomic oxygen, rendering it unavailable to recombination with O2 to recreate O3, and this results in ozone layer depletion. During winter months at the poles, and especially over Antarctica, the lack of solar radiation, including UV radiation, tends to leave O3 molecules intact, 
so that there is little free atomic oxygen, or O, to be captured by chlorine and bromine. But spring and summer change this situation. At the same time, polar vortices, or whirlpools, in the atmosphere constrain these areas of active O3 destruction to discrete areas over the poles. And this results in the notorious ozone holes again, particularly at the South Pole. Humans have been shooting things into space since the late 1950s. Some of these launches are publicised, some unknown, but certainly a large number of them are at least semi-secret or even top secret. Either way, the frequency of these launches is accelerating. There are communication satellites, spy satellites, weather satellites, GPS satellites, exploratory vehicles, and so on. The near-Earth orbital zone is now choked with satellites, both operational and defunct, to the point where newer orbital craft have to dodge this stuff, as well as each other, and also miscellaneous non-functional debris from prior launches. The amount of space junk in orbit is truly staggering. In addition, we are at the doorstep of regular, frequent, commercial spaceflight, which has to be frequent in order to be profitable. Some airlines are projecting, in the near future, flights into the stratosphere to shorten the duration of international flights. These latter vehicles will not only go up intact, but obviously will also come back down intact, with their passengers still alive and happy. And these vehicles are intended to be used repeatedly, just as conventional aircraft are now. Most, though not all, things that we launch, once they go up, are expected to come down at some point. Whether going up or coming back down, there are consequences. However, this has barely been studied at all, just because no one thought to do so. After all, what importance are a few space launches and re-entries per year within the context of the entire world and its atmosphere? This depends quite a lot on whether the propellant is solid or liquid fuel, because the chemistry is different. Nearly all the research has been done on solid fuel, because that was universally the preferred propellant for decades since far less time is required to fuel a rocket with it. However, in recent years, liquid propellants have regained prominence, but very little research has been done on their effects on the atmosphere, and in particular, the ozone layer. This again has been because rocket launches have been relatively rare, whereas CFCs and HFCs have been present in industry and household appliances for many decades. But black carbon, or soot, chlorine, bromine, and aluminium oxides, or almina, are all byproducts of rocket launches. Black carbon absorbs sunlight, but it actually creates a neat blanket throughout the atmosphere. Alumina is reflective, but it also reflects heat rising from the Earth's surface. Together, black carbon and alumina cause warming, at the same time as chlorine and bromine, are destructive to the ozone layer. Re-entry residue is simply what is called space junk, and there is a heck of a lot of it up there. Very little has been done to date to address this growing orbital clutter, but attention has recently been focused on this matter, and there are tentative plans to try and retrieve some of this material. The reason is that now, this mass of uncontrolled material is beginning to present a genuine hazard to further space launches and orbits, but for the present, this material has been allowed to remain in disintegrating orbits, and to eventually fall back to Earth. The assumption is that almost nothing of it will actually reach the ground before it burns up. Even if this is true, as seems to be the case, the burning up part itself is problematic. Besides the soot or black carbon problem, which is a pollutant in itself, rockets and satellites are essentially computers, and computers rely on their operation on highly toxic substances, like rare earths, also called rare metals. These elements are not actually rare in the sense of being scarce. Rather, they are dispersed instead of appearing in discrete deposits like coal, gold, silver, and other substances tend to be. Because rare earths are so thinly spread out, they are difficult to mine, and require considerable effort to retrieve, and mining rare earths is tremendously destructive and polluting. Obviously reusable launch vehicles would solve some of this problem, since it is fantastically wasteful and expensive to have to build a new rocket every time you want to launch something. This was a major rationale for the American Space Shuttle program, and the former Soviet Union also attempted a shuttle program, until they realised just how expensive it would be. The technological difficulties of getting a launch rocket to land safely have seemed insurmountable. Private companies like SpaceX have been working furiously to overcome these difficulties, 
since they have the money and don't need to get past any governmental legislative body. This latter consideration can involve prolonged delays, and there is always the risk of funding cancellations. There are people who bemoan the entry of private companies into what once were national space programmes, but these national programmes are argued to be at the whims of politicians, who typically have no real appreciation for the scientific objective involved. In the 1990s, for instance, the Superconducting Supercollider, or SSC, would have been larger and more powerful than the current Large Hadron Collider, but funding was cancelled by the US Congress after construction had already begun. This was thought to be because the politicians in the US Congress couldn't seem to grasp the importance of research into basic subatomic physics. The point here is that private companies have the money, and the motivation, to do things that governments often cannot, and this applies to something as obviously desirable as reusable launch vehicles. This, in a nutshell, is the issue with space launches on the ozone layer. Without the ozone layer, we are all dead, fried meat and carbonised vegetables. This is not a desirable state of things. However, very little attention has been paid to the damage done to the atmosphere and environment in general by rocket launches. Something is most assuredly happening up there, but we really don't understand what this is. We don't have any idea of whether liquid propellants are better or worse than solid propellants, and we really should be trying to find this out. We should also be researching and creating alternative propellants that may not be as damaging as the current ones. Ideally, we'd be solving all of these issues before they even became issues. But time, greed, fame and curiosity makes this highly unlikely. We need only take a look at history to know this is true. Humanity's space programmes are in their early infancies. But now is the time to find out how damaging these programmes are. Not after the damage has become obvious and critical. We can't afford to continue to be stupid or ignorant of this. Space exploration is incredibly exciting and promising, but we need to go about it with careful consideration. Are we alone in the universe? This has been one of the biggest questions in human history. From the days of ancient Egypt to the modern age, from the Mayans in the West to the Chinese in the East, every single civilization in the world has looked up at the horizon and wondered, what else was there? We created mythologies, studied the sky, developed math, science and technology, all to try and explain it, to hunt for answers. And ever since we've learned that our solar system isn't the only one with planets, that in fact, many stars appear to have rocky planets just like our own, astronomers have been looking for life blooming on Earth 2.0. Thanks to some clever physics, powerful telescopes and brilliant minds, we are now even able to see an exoplanet's atmosphere from light years away and discover the chemicals of life. Turns out, the answer for the big question might come far sooner than we think. As we explained in a previous video, all light is made of photons, massless particles that carry the electromagnetic force. They make up the electromagnetic spectrum the range of wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation going from mild radio waves all the way to powerful gamma rays. Right in the middle of this vast spectrum, there's visible light, the wavelengths we are able to perceive with the naked eye. When we see an object, we are seeing the light bouncing off it. Different objects and elements reflect different wavelengths based on the size and shape of their structures. On Earth, most life uses some kind of pigment to reflect specific colours, like the green chlorophyll in plants orange carotene in carrots, or brown melanin in humans. Others, like the morpho butterfly, are more clever. They shape their wings with elaborate, microscopic structures, tailor-made to capture certain wavelengths of light, while reflecting others. This is called structural coloration, and it produces vibrant colours, often blue, that change reflectiveness depending on the viewing angle. Living organisms, however, aren't the only things in the universe capable of having colour. Going more basic than that, Different molecules and chemical elements can have their own shades. Scientists have even figured out a way to study and identify different elements based on the precise wavelengths of photons they absorb or emit. That study is called spectroscopy. Physics and chemistry have taught us that different chemical elements have different numbers of electrons inside them, layered in multiple energy levels. These electrons are organised in shells, 
and each one of them can move to higher and lower energy states if given enough energy. But that's the catch. Only specific amounts of energy can make an electron jump from level to level, give it any more or any less and it won't work. And that amount changes from element to element, since each shell is distinct from the last. If you shoot electrons at hydrogen atoms, you'll see them emit light at very particular wavelengths. Repeat the same experiment with helium, and you'll get different wavelengths, and so on. By combining these emissions in a line, you get their emission spectra. Do these experiments long enough with different elements and molecules, and you can build a database containing each one's fingerprint. Since photons behave a lot like electrons, and light is basically pure energy, you can apply this technique to any star, planet, or nebula in the universe. In 1802, physicist William Hyde Wollaston realised that when divided using a prism, sunlight's colours weren't spread uniformly, but instead had missing patches of colours, which appeared as dark bands in the sun's spectrum. Later in the 19th century, using the many advancements done in the field during previous decades, William and Margaret Huggins used spectroscopy to determine that the stars were composed of the same elements as found on Earth. They were also the first to distinguish nebulae from stars. By using spectral techniques to analyse light from the Cat's Eye Nebula, NGC 6543. By the beginning of the 1900s, thanks to the outstanding work of people like the Harvard Computers, a team of skilled astronomers tasked with analysing and classifying astronomical data, we had a catalogue so large that scientists were able to create an entire diagram dividing thousands of stars into spectral classes based on their luminosity and surface temperature all by looking at their light and comparing it with what we already knew about spectral lines. And for the longest time, that's as far as we could see. Until the 1990s, when technology evolved to the point where we began finding planets orbiting other stars. Over the years, scientists have used many methods to detect exoplanets. The first ones were found when a pulsar, a type of neutron star known for its microsecond precision, inexplicably slowed down its pulses from time to time. Another way is to search for deviances in the star's distance from Earth, using its light's wavelengths. But the most technical and most useful, if you want to find alien life, is the transit method. When a planet passes in front of its parent star, the star's light is blocked a little. That effect is extremely faint since stars are usually hundreds of times larger and brighter than their surrounding planets. However, if you have a telescope sensitive enough, you can detect such almost imperceptible dips. In fact, from more than 4,400 exoplanets confirmed so far in missions such as Kepler and TESS, about 75% have been detected using this technique. So you could say astronomers have gotten pretty good at spotting passing exoplanets. But what's so great about this transition method? During transit, light from the star passes through the upper atmosphere of the planet. By studying the high-resolution stellar spectrum carefully, we can detect elements present in the planet's atmosphere. That means we can use spectroscopy to see if the planet has liquid water or even complex carbon molecules that could indicate the presence of alien life. This isn't sci-fi. This is done using current technologies. Space agencies have even launched telescopes with this exact purpose and the next generation of telescopes will look even deeper into the sky to find planets with atmospheres like our own. The Kepler Space Telescope was launched by NASA in 2009 with the express mission to discover Earth-sized planets orbiting other stars. It looked into a fixed part of the sky continuously monitoring the brightness of approximately 150,000 main-sequence stars for any dimming caused by exoplanet transit. Over its more than nine years of operation, the telescope detected 2,662 planets, several of them in their star's habitable zones. In 2018, it was time for NASA's Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, or TESS for short, to launch, trading Kepler's larger single mirror and fixed field of view to multiple smaller mirrors with a much larger field of view, along with an orbit that allows the telescope to eventually look at the entire sky. Since its launch, TESS has identified 2,601 candidate exoplanets, of which 122 have been confirmed so far. And because it looks at the entire sky, 
It's able to find planets orbiting stars much brighter than the ones Kepler discovered, making them far more suitable for atmospheric spectral analysis. But technology and rocket payload sizes have evolved greatly since these two launched. So over the course of the next few years, we'll see the development of larger and more sensitive projects. With an estimated launch window in 2026, the European Space Agency's Plateau Space Telescope is looking to mix the best of both Kepler and TESS. Plateau will have 26 independent telescopes compared to TESS's four. These multiple lenses will allow it to look at a wider angle in the sky like TESS, and their increased size and number will put the telescope's resolution on par with Kepler. Its mission will also be a hybrid. Like TESS, it will have a larger field of view and target Earth-sized planets around bright stars. And like Kepler, it will stare at patches of sky long enough to be sensitive to Earth-sized planets on year-long orbits around Sun-like stars. Later in 2028, ESA is planning a follow-up mission with Ariel, a telescope built specifically to look at known exoplanets during their transit and analyse their atmospheres. It'll be the first dedicated mission to measure the chemical composition and thermal structures of hundreds of transiting exoplanets. And finally, we have the James Webb Space Telescope, NASA's greatest challenge so far and the nightmare of many engineers, which aims to finally launch later this year after almost a decade delayed. Although a general purpose telescope much like Hubble before it, it will commit some of its time to look at exoplanets as well. And with a mirror of 6.5 meters in diameter, six times Hubble's in area. James Webb will be able to detect much fainter objects and changes in wavelengths, promising to revolutionise astronomy as a whole, including the search for alien life. However, by the end of this decade, even the mighty JWST might find itself on the smaller size of greater, more ambitious projects. But that's a story for another day. The origin of astronomy goes all the way to the earliest days of human society, and we can see how each generation adds new discoveries and knowledge to it. From the ancient Greeks writing down the movement of the planets in the solar system, to the Harvard computers creating a catalogue of stars which became the basis for stellar spectroscopy throughout the 20th century, and on to the very nearby future of telescopes able to directly see alien chemistry in distant planets. You may even wake up tomorrow and see all over the news a headline saying we finally found alien life. It's an exciting time to be alive. Between the many planets in our solar system, Mars is definitely the one we have studied the most, besides our own. Astronomers have been observing it since ancient times, and by the 19th century, we had telescopes powerful enough to begin to see its surface. As soon as we could launch probes into space, Mars was one of the first destinations. With more than 50 missions by various countries over the past century, almost half of them succeeding, the Red Planet is currently home to three active rovers and eight orbiters, all doing important experiments and data gathering to further our understanding of planetary evolution and the solar system as a whole. Of all the science going on on Mars, perhaps the most important is the search for microorganisms, either past or present. Finding life that evolved independently on another planet would rewrite history books and teach us a whole lot about the universe. For that purpose, most rovers and orbiters have been equipped with instruments to detect numerous chemicals that can indicate biological processes. And recently, a weird discovery has left scientists scratching their heads for an explanation. This is the case of Mars's vanishing methane. Methane is a chemical compound consisting of four hydrogen atoms and one carbon atom. It's the simplest of hydrocarbons, organic compounds consisting entirely of hydrogen and carbon. It's present all over Earth's biosphere, from petroleum to the human body. It's also in the atmosphere as a gas, being responsible for 20% of the total radiative forcing from all of the long-lived and globally mixed greenhouse gases. Methane has many uses in industry, as well as fuel since it's the main constituent of natural gas. And about 95% of methane in Earth's atmosphere comes from biological processes, so detecting it on another planet could not only be a valuable source of energy and heat for any future colonisation attempt, but also a hint of hidden microbial alien life. That being said, how can we find it? There are many ways scientists can detect chemical elements. They can use specific reactants that only bind to certain molecules. They can study the rate of radioactive decay to determine the atomic number. 
They can even blast the sample with lasers to read its emission lines. That last one is called spectroscopy, and it's so interesting we already made an entire episode about it. But here's the gist. Molecules and chemical elements absorb and emit light at very specific wavelengths. So by shining lasers through a sample, scientists can see exactly what kinds of elements it contains. Think of it like taking their fingerprints. This type of instrument is exactly what the Curiosity rover used to detect and study the presence of methane on our neighbour planet. The Tunable Laser Spectrometer, or TLS, uses diode lasers to determine the temperature, pressure, velocity and max flux of the gas under observation, allowing for precise measurements. It's part of the larger sample analysis at Mars' system, essentially a portable chemistry lab made up of three different instruments that search for and measure organic chemicals and light elements that are important ingredients potentially associated with life. Curiosity has been looking at Mars' atmosphere for years. Arriving on the Red Planet in August 2012, NASA's Curiosity rover explores Gale Crater, thought by scientists to be a former lake bed, probably extinct millions of years ago when most of Mars' atmosphere evaporated into space. With 10 instruments, including high-resolution cameras, spectrometers, lasers, and even radiation detectors, the rover is capable of running many experiments at once. It can analyse soil samples to look for life, monitor weather for patterns, and measure the type and amount of harmful radiation that reaches the Martian surface from the Sun and space sources. Over the course of its almost seven-year mission at this point, Curiosity has been able to measure seasonal changes in methane concentration in Mars' atmosphere, picking up on warmer months while dialing down on winter. A notable spike in methane levels happened in 2019, right in the middle of Martian summer, solidifying this seasonal pattern. This methane could be generated by reactions between carbon dioxide and hydrogen, by deep magmatic degassing, or by ultraviolet radiation, breaking down other molecules already on the surface such as comet dust falling onto Mars. If buried underground, the gas could be stored in lattice-structured ice formations known as clathrates and released to the atmosphere through cracks in the surface at a much later time. It could also become trapped in pockets of shallow ice, such as seasonal permafrost. On the surface, ultraviolet reactions in the upper atmosphere and oxidization reactions in the lower atmosphere would transform methane into carbon dioxide, hydrogen and water vapour leading to a lifetime of the molecule of about 300 years. Although it's possible that this methane comes from inorganic sources like water rock chemistry, scientists can't rule out the possibility of biological origins, like thermal degradation of ancient organic matter, or, hopefully, a byproduct of living microbes. However, it might be tricky to pinpoint the gas's exact point of origin, since it would be quickly distributed around the planet by atmospheric circulation diluting its signal and making it difficult to identify individual sources. What scientists can say for sure is that due to the lifetime of the molecule when considering atmospheric processes, any detections today would imply it has been released relatively recently, but the methane's point of origin isn't the biggest problem of all. Meanwhile, the European Space Agency's ExoMars Trace Gas Orbiter, designed to be the gold standard for measuring methane and other gases over the whole planet, couldn't detect almost any higher up in the atmosphere, not even in the summer months. TGO is part of a larger collaborative project between the European Space Agency and the Russian Roscosmos Agency, divided in two missions. The first part, launched in 2016, placed the orbiter into Mars's orbit and carried the Entry, Descent and Landing Demonstrator Module, or EDM, known as Scaparelli. The second part aims to deliver the Rosalind Franklin rover to Mars in 2022. ESA's orbiter has a number of high-sensitivity instruments that use infrared and ultraviolet spectrometers to look at atmospheric components and identify gases from orbit, their concentration, temperature, sources, loss and cycles. Along with methane, the instruments can measure sulphur dioxide, ozone, sulfuric acid, and perform aerosol studies. The orbiter also has a neutron detector that can map hydrogen levels to a maximum depth of one meter beneath the Martian surface, thus revealing the most detailed map ever produced of water ice distribution in the shallow subsurface of Mars. Yet, with all these powerful and precise instruments, it could barely see any methane at all its measurements finding 10 to 100 times less than all previous reported detections, a result far different from the one Curiosity made at the same time. So what exactly is going on? To 
Scientists were quick to come up with hypotheses for this irregularity, chief among them due to the fact that both instruments operate at opposite times, ExoMars during the day and Curiosities during the night, that sunlight might be affecting methane concentration on Mars' atmosphere and destroying it close to the surface through some yet unknown method. The Curiosity team then tested this hypothesis by taking daytime methane measurements, and the gas indeed dissipated during the day. However, NASA is still trying to sort out why that happens. Methane released from Mars's craters should remain stable enough and accumulate in the atmosphere enough for detection by ESA's orbiter, so scientists are now looking into what process might be capable of destroying the methane before its supposed 300 year lifetime. Until then, Mars's vanishing methane will remain an enigma. Mars has been the source of many discoveries and mysteries throughout the centuries, from the first observation of Martian channels in the 19th century, to the finding of a subsurface lake below the southern polar ice cap in 2018, so it's safe to say, this isn't the first and it won't be the last time the red planet surprises us. Mars also isn't the only alien place in the solar system where we can find methane. Titan, the largest moon of Saturn, and the second largest natural satellite in the solar system, has methane clouds, rivers, and rain, making the molecule work on its environment much like water on Earth, albeit at a lower temperature. The only known moon with a significant atmosphere, and the only nitrogen-rich, dense atmosphere in the solar system, aside from Earth's, with even similar pressure, the surest place to find alien life close to home might not be Mars, but Titan instead. But that's a story for another day. People seem to be rather enthusiastic about the prospects of colonising the Moon in just the next few years, and Mars perhaps by about 2030. Which of these options is better in the immediate future really depends on what we expect in the short term and the long term. It also depends on what this colonisation will involve. Humanity has become fairly good at sending robotic spacecraft to numerous places in our solar system, but this is not the same as landing and retrieving living humans, and so we need to be careful about our next steps. Keeping humans alive and functional in a viable colony won't be easy on either the Moon or Mars, and a colony on the Moon in just a few years seems extremely optimistic. And even just landing live humans on Mars and bringing them back to Earth also alive by 2030 seems extraordinarily ambitious, and building an actual ongoing human colony is vastly more complicated. One sensible place to start making plans for this is which to aim for first. This requires some thought because both of these destinations will really only be stepping stones, and they obviously have to be successful ones. Both the Moon and Mars will present some daunting obstacles, some of them the same in both cases, others unique to each. There are a lot of things to consider, some of them being distance and time of transport, supply and resupply, physical risks, habitat construction, maintenance, rescue if necessary and even possible, and simply the risk of going crazy in a tightly confined alien environment. Let us look at these obstacles and see where they lead us. Humans are by any measure an invasive, radiating species. All organisms are, generally speaking, unless and until they hit some kind of adaptive wall. In our case, with regard to continuing space exploration, there are two chains of thought. On one hand, we expand inexorably, because our population swells, and because we are insatiably curious, and are captivated by a romantic notion of sending humans into unknown places in our universe. On the other hand, while life on Earth has adapted to some very strange and extreme conditions here on Earth, we are in no way, shape or form, capable of surviving for more than mere seconds in the conditions on the Moon or Mars. Yet we want to start populating the rest of our star system, at least to whatever extent we can. We will certainly attempt this, and so we need to deal with the practicalities of the matter. This is of course utterly impossible for us, without extensive and sophisticated technology, and we need to learn these technologies under increasingly realistic conditions. There is an extraordinarily long list of concerns we need to address before we attempt anything as ambitious as an extraterrestrial colony. We are not even close to managing many of these concerns at the moment. Here is a quick overview of just a few of the bigger ones.
biological hazards of space travel have become increasingly clear since the Apollo program, and with the sustained occupation of the International Space Station, especially Scott Kelly's near year on the ISS. Astronauts on the ISS for prolonged periods experience some worrisome effects on their musculoskeletal systems, neurological systems, vascular systems, genomes and more. Comparing Scott Kelly's biology with that of his twin brother, the retired astronaut Mark Kelly can only yield limited information because of the sample size, but is nonetheless alarming. Scott experienced a variety of changes to multiple organ systems, some of which may be chronic, but we don't know enough yet to be certain. It is important to keep in mind that these occurred in low Earth orbit, under microgravity conditions. Apollo astronauts also experienced some physical effects on their trips to the Moon and back, but these trips were only a matter of days. A sustained presence on either the Moon or Mars, and the trip durations of simply getting to Mars and back, present biological challenges that are daunting. Radiation is an extremely worrisome problem, since there is no real practical way at present to adequately shield space travellers from this. And a second radiation, the radiation caused when cosmic radiation ionises the materials the spacecraft is made of, is also a potential problem. How do we build long-term habitats on either the Moon or Mars? Shipping all the materials we need from Earth even to the Moon is nearly impossible, and practically impossible in the case of Mars. And to even build these habitats would require workers already there, either humans or very sophisticated robots. There are various possibilities for habitats, including temporary inflatable structures pre-sent to specified sites, to ambitious proposals to somehow process local materials like regolith into construction materials and even ideas to use 3D printers to build components of habitats using processed materials on the Moon or Mars. However, inflatable habitats would be vulnerable to penetration by micrometeoroids, and processing local materials would take time and considerable technology. Another possibility would be to use existing lava tubes, which are present on both the Moon and Mars, as habitats reinforced as necessary. This would alleviate the problem of radiation to a significant degree for those within these areas, Needless to say, they would still need to be oxygenated, heated, lighted, and pressure and humidity controlled. Temperature extremes are considerable on both the Moon and Mars, which would not only be a risk to any human occupants, they would also present problems for any machinery on the surface. This means that habitat locations would have to be carefully chosen to minimise these temperature swings. There are possible locations at the south polar region of the Moon, and also at various places on Mars. Colonists will have to produce their own food, and so an abundant source of light and temperature regulation will be necessary for both the food sources and the colonists. Water and oxygen would also have to be locally sourced. We know that both the Moon and Mars have abundant supplies of water, but there would need to be processing centres for converting the ice to water, and for separating the water molecules into hydrogen and oxygen. There would also have to be power sources, perhaps solar, hydrogen separated from water, or perhaps nuclear, and the needs for power, oxygen, and water would be immediate. So too would be the need for food. Eventually, any colonies would have to become largely, if not entirely, self-sufficient, and fairly rapidly. Although the Moon is only three days away, the cost of shipping any supplies would be enormous. Mars, however, is many months' distance from Earth, so regularly resupplying a Mars colony would be profoundly impractical, if not impossible. There would, needless to say, have to be a significant number of engineers and technicians to maintain and repair any of the technology needed at either location. On Mars, the communication delay would make addressing any true emergencies difficult or impossible from Earth. Another consideration, which took the Apollo teams by surprise, is that moon dust proved to be significantly damaging and insidious. It appeared to infiltrate everywhere, and adhered to most surfaces. This dust, since it was subjected to very little erosion, was sharp and glassy, difficult or impossible to clean away, and infiltrated the lander and then the command module. Martian dust is probably not this bad, but we don't know for certain. We know that any moon inhabitants would have to deal with dust constantly, but we don't know yet how much of a problem Martian dust will present. The rovers there have seemed to operate acceptably. Although solar panels became covered with dust, and Martian dust storms are notoriously immense and long-lasting, we don't know what an entire colony may have to deal with. Finally, there is the delicate matter of waste disposal. 
in particular human waste in the forms of urine and feces. Urine on the ISS has already been regularly processed by the American section of the station into drinking water, and there are fairly well advanced experiments into converting feces into a consumable food source, but we have no idea how much of this diet could be tolerated by colonists, or if it might have any long-term deleterious effects. As mentioned, the ISS is in low Earth orbit, and experiences microgravity, although it is shielded from radiation by the Earth's magnetic field. The ISS orbits at a distance of about 248 miles, or 400 kilometers, above the Earth, whereas Earth's magnetosphere extends an average of 40,000 miles, or 65,000 kilometers, with considerable variation due to solar wind above the Earth's surface. This means in all likelihood that physiological and neurological problems astronauts develop aboard the SS are largely due to low gravity conditions there. Any colonists on the Moon and Mars will experience very low gravity conditions for very extended periods of time, perhaps years in the case of Mars. And so we need to develop ways to counter the muscular and skeletal degeneration, the changes in blood pressure in different parts of the body, the alterations in major blood vessels that may predispose astronauts to strokes, the apparent cognitive degeneration, sometimes observed, and numerous other changes, including genetic alterations. On the Moon on Mars, however, in addition to their extremely weak gravitational fields, they also lack magnetospheres, and as a result, colonists will be exposed to significant solar and cosmic radiation. Since we have no way of ethically testing what will happen to humans under such conditions, we have no choice but to try as hard as we can to ensure that any feasible shielding measure we devise will in fact be adequate. Remember that any shielding will add weight to the already enormously expensive active launching vehicles, large enough to contain a group of humans in space. Lava tubes mentioned earlier could be an effective way of addressing this problem. These are just a few of the numerous problems we will have to solve in any effort to colonise, in any meaningful sense of the word, a different celestial body. There are many others, including the physiological strain of being cooped up with the same small group, and the effects of living in such alien environments for extended periods. When the Apollo 11 astronauts were released from their 21-day quarantine, after having spent six days together in space and on the moon, Neil Armstrong mentioned that it was not something he'd like to do on a regular basis. In 2016, Chris McKay, a planetary scientist at the NASA Ames Research Center, was asked by Popular Science if, if we should first try to colonize the Moon, or skip right to Mars. He answered, in part, that to him, the Moon was about as exciting as a chunk of concrete. But he also said that it would be an ideal stepping stone to Mars, because everything we'll need to know how to do on Mars is also something we'll have to learn how to do on the much closer Moon. The Moon is a blueprint to Mars, to him, there was no competition. Go to the moon first, and figure out how to do all of these things as perfectly as possible. Some place that's just a few days away. The problems of establishing a colony elsewhere in our planetary system are truly enormous. And what has been said about it in this video barely scratches the surface. Alien worlds may seem romantic, and perhaps beautiful in various ways, but they are profoundly deadly to humans. We need to be as absolutely certain as possible that we know how to survive elsewhere in our system, and nothing beats practice at anything difficult. The American space program, from Apollo to the space shuttle, killed people. The Soviet space program certainly did as well, although this is generally not acknowledged by them. The American program was so rushed in order to beat the Soviets to the moon that the former NASA engineer once said that if the Apollo program had continued, we would have lost more people in that program alone. We cannot afford a rush return to the moon in a few years, or plant humans on Mars in just 10 years, much less establish permanent presences on these bodies in the near future. Yet, these timelines are currently being pushed. I guess only time will really tell what happens in our enduring search and plans for expanding humans beyond our pale blue dot. In April 2019, a truly incredible event occurred in astronomy and astrophysics. A radio photograph of a black hole was announced and released. This image was taken and processed over a two-week period in April of 2017 by the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration, but analysis took some time. 
Around 5,000 trillion bytes of data were collected and analysed, and reported in six research papers in the Astrophysical Journal Letters. This is the black hole in the centre of the galaxy Messier 87, or M87 for short, a supergiant elliptical galaxy about 55 million light years from Earth. The image is, in a sense, not really of the black hole itself, but what is called its shadow, since there is no way to really photograph a black hole, but only the light well that energy disappears into, and around which the superheated matter and energy orbit before it all falls into it. Still, after decades of artists' impressions of what a black hole might look like, we have finally seen what we can of one. A recent analysis of this photograph has also captured the swirling magnetic field around it, seen through polarised light, and also the mysterious super-energetic jets of energy which somehow escape into space from this particular black hole, which is of a type called a blazer. Even with this iconic photo, black holes remain very enigmatic, and extremely difficult to understand. For instance, nothing that falls into a black hole can ever be recaptured, and yet, according to modern physics, no information can be destroyed. So where does this information go? Is it preserved and somehow spit out again? Also, do black holes go anywhere? A key component of this conundrum is what is called the event horizon, where all sorts of weird things seem to happen. It's time to take a trip to an event horizon. The Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration, or EHT, is not one instrument. It is a series of eight radio telescopes across four continents, linked by multiple computers coordinated by an atomic clock. What the EHT does is make repeated observations of black holes. In this immediate instance, the one in M87, as the Earth rotates, inserting new observations into the growing data set of the target. The more data that are required, the sharper the image becomes. These distinctions have to be made, just for clarity. In the event that clarity is not achieved, we can call that the clarity horizon. The particle horizon is essentially the limit of what we can see of the universe, beyond which photons have not yet reached us. In an expanding universe, it will be the case that we will never be able to see beyond a certain radius, since the edge of this sphere will always expand faster than the photons from it can reach us. This is a matter of time, distance and velocity, we exist within a particle horizon, which is why there is a limit to how far in distance and time we can see the universe. An event horizon is something different. It is the result of a gravitational field that prevents any information, which just means electromagnetic radiation and therefore information, from escaping it. It is in principle impossible to see beyond an event horizon, which is why it is called that. There are no events visible from within this horizon. The Hubble Sphere is the extent of our universe that is expanding slower than the speed of light, and is therefore observable in principle. There is theoretically a region of the universe of unknown extent beyond the Hubble Sphere, which we can never see, explore, or even detect, but which must exist in theory. This means that we exist within a particle horizon relative to a hypothetical outside observer. A clarity or conceivability horizon a concept invented specifically for this video, is when we reach a point when all of this stops making sense, in the event it ever did. It is the limit beyond which intelligibility and comprehension begin to fragment. This is an epistemological concept, rather than a mathematical one, but denotes a point beyond which mathematical and physical concepts exceed ease of comprehension and lack synthetic central integration. In other words, concepts that cannot be imagined but perhaps may only be conceived of by mathematicians and mathematical physicists. Black holes are places where gravitation is so strong that escape velocity exceeds the speed of light, thus no light or energy can escape them closer than a certain distance. There are currently two basic types of black holes as we understand them, stellar black holes, and primordial black holes. Stellar black holes form when a star of a certain minimum mass exhausts its nuclear fuel, expands violently into a supernova, and then its core collapses. This can result in a neutron star, which is interesting in itself, but if the original star was massive enough, 
This can also result in the remnants of a star collapsing so much that its gravitational field is too strong for even light to escape. Primordial black holes are something different. These are theoretical consequences of the Big Bang, and the creation of the universe as we see it now, and we don't even know if they really exist. While stellar black holes are large, primordial black holes are the consequences of conditions at the very beginning of the universe, and current theory allows them to be very small. This is because in the very early universe, all energy was packed very tightly, and so primordial black holes may have theoretically been very small. But the result is the same. They have an escape velocity beyond which even light can't travel fast enough. Escape velocity is the velocity an object has to achieve in order to escape a gravitational field. Take a rocket for example. In order to achieve escape velocity from the Earth's gravitational file, it has to reach a speed of at least 7 miles per second. Electromagnetic radiation, including light, travels at 186,000 miles per second, or 3,000 kilometers per second. A gravitational field that requires any speed higher than that creates a black hole. There have been numerous simulations of what it would be like to see a black hole, and these are bizarre. Matter and energy, including light and radiation of any type, approaching a black hole orbit around it. And the gravitational field of the black hole will bend that light and radiation to such a degree that even the radiation at the far side of the black hole, but not yet actually in it, will be visible. We know that gravitation can do this through the general theory of relativity, and also because we've directly observed it through the now familiar phenomenon of gravitational lensing. The latter is when the gravitating objects, such as stars and entire galaxies, bend light so that objects behind these bodies appear in front of them. And so, a black hole would look very weird, with its front towards us and its back away from us, and its top and bottom and sides all visible at once. We've more or less directly observed some of this with the black hole in M87, and it's truly a remarkable image. The fact is, we really don't understand what an event horizon is. Let's look at this. The black spot or space in the centre of that image, surrounded by superheated luminous gas, is called the shadow of the black hole. But there's a kind of edge there, and this roughly defines the event horizon. The event horizon is a strange and mysterious thing. It is a sphere beyond which no radiation, and therefore information, can escape. And there is an edge to this distance, called a Schwarzschild radius. This is what we seem to see in the Event Horizon Telescope image. A black space within, an area of highly energised matter beyond, and a boundary between the two. But things are not that simple. Because we are talking about the universe, and energy, and information, and the necessities of quantum physical theory. For one thing, black holes were initially modelled as being non-rotating, with a singularity. In other words, a single dimensionless point of infinite density at the centre, and a single event horizon. Now, however, astrophysicists believe that stellar black holes rotate, since the stars they were formed from are also rotating, and this creates a number of complications. For one, there are two event horizons, an outer horizon and an inner horizon called a Cauchy horizon. Cauchy was a late 18th century to early 19th century mathematician. The outer horizon is just the Schwarzschild radius. The inner, or Cauchy horizon, according to theory, is a place where cause and effect relations break down, and cause no longer precedes effect. Time travel within the Cauchy horizon could be possible. Also, a rotating black hole would not have a singularity at its centre, but rather an infinitely flat disk of matter and energy. It could also create a firewall, because the rotation would separate quantum entangled particles and release unimaginable amounts of energy. The rotation would also create an ergosphere a whirlpool effect that would drag matter and energy in the direction of rotation. A recent enhanced photo of the black hole in M87 actually shows its magnetic field swirling around as the black hole rotates. This is called frame dragging. We can't avoid the information paradox either, which really makes a greater mess of this already fairly messy situation. 
According to modern physics, information cannot be destroyed, since subatomic particles are actually a multitude of wave functions spread across the universe. What happens to the information in matter and energy when it falls into a black hole? It can't disappear permanently. One idea is that it is preserved on the surface of the outer event horizon as if it were a kind of membrane. This idea may break down however, if rotating black holes cause the outer event horizon to smear into a rather fuzzy region. Another possibility is that for a very old black hole, if they are actually evaporating through Hawking radiation, the seemingly lost information is released from the black hole back into the universe. We don't know, but this information paradox is a major stumbling block. We've seen our first black hole, or at least its shadow, thanks to the Event Horizon Telescope, but we still have only theoretical speculation about what may be going on inside that outer event horizon. It may well be that we won't be able to understand what's in there, because modern physics breaks down inside the event horizon. If there are in fact two event horizons, we have an even longer way to go to understand these things. In fact, at the moment, it's very difficult to see how or if we'll ever penetrate even the outer event horizon. We have no real idea of what may be going on within its outer barrier, that's why it's called the event horizon. We can't see through it. The universe is inconceivably big, and there are a lot of extremely big things in it. But at the risk of drifting into the pedantic, we should try to understand what exactly a thing is. This is not an idle topic in metaphysics, because there is a real risk of being fooled by apparent objects or things that look real, but aren't actually really there. Constellations are an obvious example. From our perspective, they look like actual structures of some kind, but that's only because their constituent stars are so many thousands or millions of light years away that our eyes, and often less powerful optical telescopes, cannot detect these distances. That is why the sky looks like a surface or the inside of a bowl. The chances that the stars in the familiar constellations are all actually associated with each other are essentially zero. We see constellations as distinct entities because of the unsolvability of the distances just mentioned, and also because of a human psychological phenomenon called pareidolia, which is what makes us see faces and figures in clouds, or religious figures in woodwork, or even on pieces of burnt toast. One of the things we will talk about here are areas of the universe called voids, which look from our perspective like discrete entities, but are in fact just empty spaces nearly devoid of stars and galaxies. These empty spaces are real, in a sense, but they are not things, but rather areas that are empty of things, and their edges may be quite indistinct in reality, however sharp they may appear at the distances involved. In art, on the other hand, so-called negative space is a valid concept, and artists from sculptors to bonsai masters actually think in terms of what should be eliminated, so that the finished sculpture or bonsai emerges as a consequence of removal of material. In this sense, perhaps cosmic voids should be considered things after all. These voids have no structure and no internal cohesion, rather they are the result of gravity carving out space. They are, however, a clue to what may be the actual biggest thing in the universe, and are also interesting because our galaxy and its local group seem to be in the biggest one so far discovered. Voids and structures are in fact two sides of the same coin, and at least in our universe, there can't be one without the other. So let's take a look at some candidates for the biggest thing in the universe. It must be there somewhere. If we look at the night sky, it's obvious that there are apparent spaces between the stars, and these spaces are irregular in distance. But theoretically, on a very large scale, these local irregularities should smooth out, so that the average density of matter is uniform. This is called the cosmological principle, because the initial Big Bang and the subsequent inflation of the universe should have kept the distribution of matter and energy uniform, and smoothed out irregularities. However, it did not. Using a wealth of observational data from various observational sources, like electromagnetic wavelengths such as visible, X-ray, gamma, ultraviolet and infrared wavelengths gathered from telescope satellites and computer simulations of these data, 
we can construct a very large-scale view of the universe, almost as if we were outside it looking in. What we find is that at a medium distance, the universe is spongy or foamy, with stretches of dense matter punctuated by gaps or holes that appear to be empty. It's as if one could take a mass of bubbles and squeeze it together. The result would be stretches where the edges of bubbles press together and the spaces within the bubbles themselves. The areas with the bubble edges were pressed together are where, in our universe, nearly all the visible and probably dark matter occurs. The spaces within the bubbles or voids have almost nothing we can see, just some isolated, mostly dwarf galaxies here and there, and some dust. If we step far enough away, what we see is the emergence of some kind of cosmic web, an irregular foam of matter and emptiness, with those pockets of apparent emptiness being of varying sizes, ranging from very small, astronomically speaking, to truly gigantic. The threads of visible matter that separate voids, and the accompanying dark matter in those threads, are called filaments, and the empty spaces are called voids. The overall pattern, in fact, looks rather like an electron micrograph of brain neurons, or a gigantic messy spiderweb. This web-like, foamy texture appears to be the result of random, minor fluctuations in matter density across the expanding universe. With matter, both baryonic and dark, concentrated in some places, and relatively empty space in other places, the result was gravitational pull towards what became the filamenta structure causing other adjacent areas to slowly empty out. It should be kept in mind that all distance and size estimates are just that, estimates and subject to revision. The relatively empty areas we just spoke of, voids, vary in size, some billions of light years across, that are deficient in galaxies and perhaps even dust. There is a reason for this, and it is tied with the structures we see in the universe. These voids may be pouring, though not empty of matter, but they appear to be full of dark energy, which is the force that is causing the expansion of the universe. This is what is causing space itself to expand, rather than the things in space. Simultaneously, gravitation is causing ordinary matter to congregate along the filaments, hence voids form. There are innumerable voids, but there are about 88 currently known known voids that are large enough to be noteworthy, at least to some people. Some have even been given names, like the local void and the great nothing. And to complicate things, giant voids may be composed of groups of smaller voids. For instance, there is the giant void called the giant void, about 1.5 billion light years away and approximately 1.3 billion light years in diameter. There is also something called the Great Nothing, often known as the Boötes Void, about 330 million light years in diameter. There is the Cold Spot, about 1.8 billion light years in diameter and about 3 billion light years distant from us. This Cold Spot was discovered when it turned out during a survey of the cosmic microwave background that this spot was just too cold. Subsequent study of this area by the Pan-STARRS-1 telescope in Hawaii and NASA's Wide Field Survey Explorer found that statistically, this area was short of the expected number of galaxies by about 10,000. Perhaps one of the smallest voids of any note is the SSRS2 void, only about 92 million light years across. There are in fact innumerable other voids of varying sizes, and as noted, large voids appear to be conglomerations of smaller voids. Our own galaxy, along with the local group of galaxies, seem to form something called the local sheet, evidently right on the edge of the local void. The local void is sometimes called the KBC void, named for its discoverers, Ryan Keenan, Amy Barger and Lennox Coey. Whether it actually exists, or is an illusion of perception and instrumentation, is still debated. Estimates of its extent range up to 2 billion light years in diameter. Structures, like voids, are to some extent subject to interpretation. Like voids, 
The distances from and sizes of structures are simply rough estimates and subject to change. Structures are the filaments in the web that is believed to lace throughout the universe. And these filaments contain galaxies, gas and dark matter. There is some evidence that matter flows along these filaments and what were once thought to be discrete, independent structures are now suspected to in fact be sections of filaments. What have been in the past considered to be separate structures may actually be sections of one giant structure. These structures may be star clusters, quasar clusters, strings of galaxies or galactic clusters, and so on. At cosmic distances and scales, it's very hard to tell, and astronomers and astrophysicists have just begun to grasp the larger structure of the universe as a whole. But it seems that matter, whether baryonic, ordinary matter, or dark matter, is strung together in a web like lattice that is spread through the entire universe. For instance, the Great Gamma Ray Burst Ring is a group of nine gamma ray burst sources, perhaps 9.1 billion light years away and approximately 5.6 billion light years in diameter. It resides in a filament, but it may also be a semi independent, partially self contained, and coherent structure. There is also the Sloan Great Wall about 1.37 billion light years in length and about 1 billion light years away. Another goes by a very prosaic name, the huge LQG, or the huge large quasar group. This is a group of 73 quasars, about 4 billion light years in size, and about 9 billion light years from Earth. Statistical analysis indicates that these quasars are in fact gravitationally linked, which would make them a real discrete structure. This may be a statistical artifact, however, but if it is real, it is indeed both huge and large, and so the name fits, even if this may be a failure of imagination. As another example of this seeming lack of imagination, there is a very large telescope, part of the European Southern Observatory, or ESO, in the Atacama Desert of Chile, called the VLT. This just means very large telescope. The fact is, there are many apparent structures that are enormous in size, far too many to discuss here, but all are apparently associated with filaments. The current title holder for the largest structure in the universe is the Hercules Corona Borealis Great Wall. This is, again, an apparent discrete structure of staggering size about 10 billion light years in width, about 10 billion light years distant from us, and is made up of several billion galaxies. It was identified by the sheer volume of gamma ray bursts from its source in the Hercules Corona Borealis constellations. It's so big, in fact, that according to current astrophysics, it should not exist, at least as a separate entity. If we want to discuss what might be the largest thing in the universe, we ought to first know if what we are talking about is real, and a discrete, unitary, and cohesive thing. This is where the cosmic web comes in. Seeing a slowed down video of an explosion is interesting, because one can see the energy, in terms of heat and light, rapidly begins to form threads and filaments that surround relatively empty spaces. If the video were stopped at a given frame after a sufficient few seconds had elapsed, it might be possible to name some of the spaces or voids, and name some of the shreds of energy or filaments in that frame. This is what we are beginning to see as we study the universe in greater detail. We are seeing a frame from the development of the Big Bang from 13.78 billion years ago to now. This cosmic web had been theorised decades ago to exist, but until very recently, the technology to imagine it did not exist. Now, however, sections of the web are being imaged for the first time using the MUSE instrument, which is part of the VLT in the Atacama Desert. MUSE is the acronym for Multi-Unit Spectroscopic Explorer, which as the name suggests, is a very advanced spectrometer, which has recently imaged previously unknown dwarf galaxies in filaments of the web and has also observed and charted stretches of the filaments themselves, using emissions from the gases in the filaments. 
The universe, then, is not homogeneous in the distribution of matter. Rather, matter is unevenly splattered throughout the universe, but everything seems to be interconnected via these filaments of matter and gas. Why does all this matter arrange itself into these filaments? The best guess, for now, is random chaotic irregularities that were created during the Big Bang, and then the differential gravitational fields that resulted from these irregularities took over. The best way to look at this may perhaps be to walk it backwards, and start from what we know. In this case, we can see the uneven and spotty distribution of observable matter. We know that there are strings, filaments of matter, and that there are voids. There is evidence that these filaments and voids are where normal and dark matter are collected, and we can trace the current porous appearance of the universe to the consequences of the Big Bang. And this means that the universe contains scaffolding of matter and gravity surrounding voids of relative emptiness. Any other big thing in the universe, as far as we know at this moment, is just a section of this web. This includes the Hercules Corona Borealis Great Wall, the Sloan Great Wall, and anything else you might think of. All of these unimaginably gigantic features of the universe are all sections of this cosmic web. They look like separate entities only because our observations haven't yet caught up with our simulations. But they are not separate entities. They are remnants, sections, cinders, bubbles of the Big Bang. This is what we are beginning to see now. There are lots of things in our universe that look inconceivably large, and so it's natural to ask, what is the biggest thing in the universe? One early answer was the universe itself, but it seems hard to see how the universe can both be itself and also contain itself without being different from itself. There's a self-referential problem there. But that early answer was pretty close, because it gets at what is contained in the universe that we can see. Just to be clear, it's perfectly fine to discuss objects or regions of things as if they were isolatable, because we do that all the time. And in fact, that's actually how everything is discussed. From science to literature, to art and people, to cultures to, well, just about everything. It's probably just about impossible to avoid doing this and still sound intelligible. It's mainly a matter of context and subject. In the present case, if we ask, what is the biggest thing the universe contains that is not itself? The answer, at least for now, is the cosmic web. It's the biggest thing in the universe that we know of. It seems to be a real thing, continuous and complete. Pieces or sections of which have been thought of as the biggest thing at various times. And it has a clear ontological foundation in astrophysics, with the Big Bang. There is a certain attraction to the idea that space is silent and still. It seems timeless and unchanging. The stars always seem to shine from the same place. And this sense of eternity may serve for some people as an anchor, a last resort, in a human world of unending chaos. But space is not like that at all. Rather, it is violent, ferocious and lethal. It is fatally cold and fatally hot and seething with unimaginable energy that can fry you instantly. We are protected from this by a variety of factors that determine if we exist or not. That we can think about it at all is only because of the fundamental physical laws that determine if Earth is habitable or not. We in fact exist in a protective bubble, surrounded by, not to be too dramatic about it, violent, fatal horror. This violent, fatal horror is our own sun, which warms us melts ice and snow in spring, and gives us lovely tans. But it can also kill us instantaneously. Our protective bubble is our magnetosphere and ionosphere. As scary as that may sound, this lovely star of ours gives us life and creates our weather and seasons, along with a number of other factors that are perfectly in balance to make our planet habitable. But what are the weather conditions like outside of Earth's atmosphere? Let's take a look. Space is full of stuff, and this is not just stars and galaxies and gas and dust. It is also full of radiation and the foam of virtual particles popping into and out of existence. 
it's busy out there. Voyager 1 has heard the hum of interstellar space. This hum is the gaseous plasma of space beyond the heliopause of our star, full of energetic particles. This is not technically what we call space weather, but the point is that nothing out there is peaceful or uneventful. Space weather consists of solar wind, coronal ejections, flares, cyclical and roughly predictable sunspots, and minor and expected sunspots, and other phenomena of this sort. All stars create space weather, and sometimes it's quite dramatic. The effects of these can be significant, and as a result, it's important to understand what space weather is and how it occurs. This involves quite a lot of physics, specifically heliophysics, but the outlines are roughly explainable. Stars, including our sun, may seem calm and constant to most of us, but they are not like this. They are in fact violent maelstroms of nuclear fusion, and the effects of this extend far beyond just heat and light. And even these familiar experiences may be deadly, depending on the star. But space weather is something altogether different. Every star has space weather, which may extend for billions of miles or kilometres from its photosphere, depending on the size and activity of the star. Around our sun, this region is called the heliosphere, which is extremely asymmetrical and constantly changing in shape due to the pressure of solar wind and the sun's magnetic field. We hope you didn't get the idea that this would be simple. Consider the heliosphere. The heliosphere is a kind of bubble, caused by the sun's emissions of energy, that extends far beyond the solar system. It's composed of several parts, the heliosphere proper, and several layers forming its outer edge. These include the termination shock, the helios heath, a zone where the solar radiation has slowed to subsonic speeds, and then the heliopause, where the solar wind is stopped by the interstellar medium. Solar flares are short, individually unpredictable electromagnetic events that blast various types of electromagnetic radiation into space. They often form spectacular loops, because they are partially formed of ionised or electrically charged plasma from the sun, which then follows magnetic field lines. Coronal mass ejections, or CMEs, are huge ejections of plasma and magnetic energy from the sun's corona, carrying staggering amounts of energy at speeds up to 3,000 km per second. They contain billions of tons of material from the corona, and carry portions of the sun's magnetic field. Solar flares and CMEs are often discussed together as solar eruptions. There are also coronal holes, which are areas that appear dark in extreme ultraviolet and x-rays because they are cooler and less dense than surrounding hotter regions of the coronal plasma. The magnetic field in coronal holes is more open and unipolar, and as a result, these holes are the source of relatively fast streams of solar wind. The behaviour of our star can and does wreak havoc here on Earth, disrupting communications, power grids, Earth weather, satellites, and even the health and survival of astronauts, either on the ISS or beyond. It also causes the Van Allen belts, which are not a real danger to astronauts or probes, because these belts can be avoided, but which must be taken into account. Despite this, we're lucky, because our Sun, as a main sequence G-type star, is fairly placid as stars go. The most common type of star in our galaxy, and perhaps the universe, are red dwarfs, usually classed as M-type stars although some classifications include K-type stars as well. In our own immediate neighbourhood, 50 of the 60 nearest stars are red dwarfs, such as Proxima Centauri. Proxima Centauri even has a planet that seems to occupy its habitable zone, although habitable may not be the best choice of words. The problem with red dwarfs is that they are generally long-lived, since their helium is continually remixed with hydrogen by convection and therefore slow to be consumed in fusion reactions. They are also extremely unstable, 
and can flare up multiple times on a terrestrial Earth day. These flares spew out intense radiation. Proxima Centauri is one such very unstable star. Proxima Centauri is only 4.24 light years away, but using current rather than fanciful technology and using gravity assist, it would take 19,000 to 75,000 Earth years to get there. But Proxima Centauri apparently has at least one planet which seems to be in its habitable zone, and this sounds interesting. There might be some sort of life there, and this would be very interesting indeed. Unfortunately, this is also extremely unlikely, because Proxima Centauri is very highly unstable, blasting out withering amounts of various types of lethal radiation several times every Earth day. This, paradoxically, might jumpstart the initial appearance of life on Proxima Centauri, but these frequent, extraordinarily power blasts would also erode whatever atmosphere the planet may have developed. And as of now, we don't know if it actually has any atmosphere left, assuming it ever had one to begin with. As mentioned, the most well-known and familiar kinds of solar events that can cause us enormous problems are flares, coronal mass ejections, sunspots and geomagnetic storms. Some of these events are correlated with mass communication failures and power grid failure. For example, the so-called Carrington event of 1859, a coronal mass ejection event, or CME, spontaneously lit up or burned out telegraph lines around the world. In March 1989, a huge CME brought down parts of Canada's power grid and melted some electrical transformers in the US state of New Jersey. In April of 2001, the most powerful flare ever recorded occurred, but we were lucky in that it wasn't directed towards us. If it had been, it would have resulted in worldwide communication and satellite failures. Near Halloween in 2003, a geomagnetic storm caused by a solar flare caused air travel to be rerouted, halted satellite communications, and caused a power failure in Sweden. Our magnetic field affords us considerable, but not complete, protection from most solar events. But this is not the case for satellites, and certainly wouldn't be true for any astronauts travelling through interplanetary space. Apollo astronauts were frankly very lucky that nothing major happened on the Sun during their trips to the Moon and back. Travellers to Mars and someday even beyond will almost certainly not be so lucky. Currently, ageing and decentralised power grids are always vulnerable to flares and CMEs, and GPS positioning satellites are perpetually vulnerable to such events. Any crewed missions to Mars and beyond would absolutely have to carry shielding to protect the crews and instrumentation from frying as a result of a massive solar event, and this shielding would have to be considerably more robust than the shielding needed just to protect the crews and craft from ordinary background cosmic radiation. Perhaps not surprisingly, space weather is monitored continually, and there is, in the US, a division of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, called the Space Weather Prediction Center, and the National Centers for Environmental Information, or NCEI, which monitor and collate solar events to generate predictions, much as the Earth's weather is predicted or forecasted as far in advance as possible. As is well known, our own Sun has a partially predictable sunspot cycle of about 11 years duration. Sunspots are magnetic in origin, but we still do not fully understand the mechanisms. A recent study by the National Centre for Atmospheric Research has suggested that there is actually a 22-year cycle, with the 11-year cycle embedded in it. As technology becomes more sophisticated, it becomes more complex, and thus more vulnerable to unpredictability and even failures. What is clear is that since we can't alter our sun's behaviour, we need to invest as much as we can in understanding and predicting this behaviour, so that we can plan around it. Certainly, shooting people into interplanetary space without knowing what conditions they may encounter is blindly reckless. Space is not a pleasant place, it isn't calm, peaceful, quiet, or benign. Rather, it is violent and deadly, including to all of us still remaining back here on Earth. If we think about how reliant we are on power grids, the internet, cell phones, GPS, and other such technologies, we should be rather worried about just how vulnerable these technologies actually are, and how at the mercy of our own star, all of this spawning mess really is. 
Our solar system is home to many different environments, from the crushing inferno of Venus to the suffocating cold of Mars, from the paper-thin atmosphere of Mercury to the unending hurricanes of the gas giants. There is no shortage of extremes for astronomers to explore and for science to be made. Often overlooked, its many moons are as diverse as the planets in sizes, atmospheres and geological features. Some are even estimated to have several times more water than Earth. Among them, there's one that has surprised scientists for decades, and could even be the safest bet of finding life elsewhere in our solar system. Titan. Discovered by astronomer Christian Huygens in 1655, Titan is the largest moon of Saturn and second largest in the solar system, losing only to Ganymede of Jupiter. It's bigger than the planet Mercury, and more than twice the size of Pluto. If it would orbit the Sun instead of Saturn, it would definitely be considered a planet. The Moon's composition is not unique among those in the outer planets, but it is certainly alien compared to what most of us are accustomed to, ten times further away from the Sun than Earth, and tidally locked to Saturn. It takes almost 16 days to orbit the planet, and 29 years to orbit the Sun. At this distance, it receives so little sunlight that the surface temperature is minus 179 degrees Celsius. Titan is half water ice and half rocky material, with a silicate core surrounded by ice 6, a form of high pressure ice that can exist even in temperatures as high as 80 degrees Celsius. After this ice, there is a layer of several kilometres deep containing a salty water ocean mixed with ammonia, which mixture would allow the water to stay liquid even at normally freezing conditions. Enveloping this salty ocean, there is a crust of regular water ice, that due to Titan's extremely low surface temperatures, behaves much like Earth's rocky crust. This solid layer is decoupled from the interior, which means it floats and shifts on top of the interior ocean. The interaction between the oceanic layer and ice crust works much like Earth's magma and its own crust, creating volcanoes as pressure builds up. But rather than erupting molten rock, on Titan, the cryovolcanoes would erupt volatiles such as water, ammonia and methane, spewing a super-chilled liquid into its atmosphere. But the weirdness of Titan isn't over. So let's talk about the rain. Many moons in the solar system have underground oceans, like Ganymede, Europa and Enceladus. Some have even cryovolcanoes and geysers. But unlike them, Titan is the only known moon with a significant atmosphere surrounding its frozen crust. It's 96% nitrogen, 3.5% methane, and 0.5% hydrogen, with traces of argon, carbon monoxide, and a lot of hydrocarbons. This atmosphere is denser than Earth's, with a surface pressure of about 1.48 times that of our planet. At this pressure, and with Titan's low surface temperature, methane, which is normally a gas on places like Earth and Mars, can exist as a liquid, and this means that just like Earth has a water cycle, Titan has one of its own, but with methane. Titan has lakes, rain, and it's the only other solar system body known to have large amounts of liquid on its surface. This is important because the water cycle is a key part of the development of life on our own planet. It's how water reaches plants, animals, and it also moves things like nutrients, pathogens and sediment in and out of aquatic ecosystems. And water is key to life on Earth because it is capable of dissolving more substances than any other liquid, being even dubbed the universal solvent. It means that wherever water goes, either through the air, the ground, or through our bodies, it takes along valuable chemicals, minerals, and nutrients. On Titan, a similar process could occur with methane. We talked about the importance of methane in biological processes before. However, Titan is the only place on the solar system that we found so far where the molecule can exist as a liquid instead of gas. So even though methane, unlike water, is a non-polar molecule, which diminishes its solvent properties, Titan's surface and atmosphere are full of hydrocarbons, allowing for the formation of complex organic molecules as the liquid methane circulates through the planet on its cycle. In fact, NASA's Cassini spacecraft already detected neutral and ionised molecules in Titan's ionosphere, including anions and negatively charged molecules. These linear molecules are understood to be building blocks of more complex molecules, 
and might even have acted as the basis for the earliest forms of life on Earth. And Cassini wasn't alone. Titan is one of the few bodies in the solar system where we have already landed. The Cassini-Huygens Space Research Mission was a collaboration between NASA, the ESA and the Italian Space Agency to send both a space probe to orbit Saturn and a lander to descend into the clouds of Titan. Cassini was the first probe to orbit Saturn and the Huygens lander was the first human-made object to land on a world in the distant outer solar system. Until the Cassini-Huygens mission, little was known about Titan, save that it was a Mercury-sized world whose surface was veiled beneath a thick, nitrogen-rich atmosphere. We couldn't see the surface at all, let alone observe any geological processes. What laid beneath the thick, orange clouds was still largely a mystery. Arriving on Saturn in 2004, Cassini orbited Saturn for 13 years, studying the planet and its system until 2017. Meanwhile, Huygens successfully landed by parachute on Titan on January 14, 2005, returning a lot of data to Earth. As it descended for two and a half hours, Huygens took measurements of Titan's atmospheric composition and pictures of its surface. The probe not only survived the descent and landing, but it continued to transmit data for about 90 minutes on the Moon's frigid surface until its batteries were drained. It was the first to make direct measurements of Titan's lower atmosphere. Over the years, Cassini would complete more than 100 targeted flybys of Titan, using its suit of tools, including radar and infrared instruments, to peer through Titan's haze and finally give scientists a detailed view of the Moon's surface and complex atmosphere. The probe revealed details of the Moon's environment, like lakes, clouds, rain, and a subsurface ocean of salty water. It also saw distinct seasons, lasting about 7.5 Earth years each. Starting in 2011, the spacecraft caught glimpses of the transition from fall to winter at Titan's South Pole, the first time anyone has seen the onset of a Titan winter, and watched as summer came to the north. We've also discovered giant sand dunes hundreds of kilometres along the Moon's equator, made of solid water ice coated with hydrocarbons that fall from the atmosphere. The information gathered by both the probe and the lander revealed a surprisingly Earth-like world and raised fascinating new questions for subsequent studies. Yet, the scientists weren't done. Cassini might have finished its mission in 2017, but we are going to Titan once more, this time with a flying robot. NASA's Dragonfly will be a robotic lander with eight rotors and is intended to make the first powered and fully controlled atmospheric flight on any moon. It'll weigh about 450 kilograms and fly like a large drone, taking advantage of Titan's dense atmosphere, four times denser than Earth's, to fly its entire science payload to new places for repeatable and targeted access to the surface materials. Thanks to more than a decade of Cassini data, NASA was able to choose a calm weather period to land along with a relatively safe site full of promising scientific targets. Dragonfly will first land at the equatorial Shangri-La dune fields, which are terrestrially similar to the linear dunes in Nambia in southern Africa and offer a diverse sampling location. The aircraft will explore this region by performing controlled flights and vertical takeoffs, stopping along the way to take samples from compelling areas with diverse geography. It will finally reach the Salk Impact Crater, where there is evidence of past liquid water, organics and energy, which together make up the recipe for life. The lander will eventually fly more than 175 kilometers, nearly double the distance traveled to date by all the Mars rovers combined. Due to the lander's size and Titan's distance to the Sun, solar power is impractical, so Dragonfly will be powered by a radioisotope thermoelectric generator, generating energy through the heat of decaying radioactive elements like the ones already in use by the Curiosity and Perseverance Mars rovers. The mission is expected to launch in 2027 and reach Saturn by 2034. One of the most fascinating, unique and surprisingly Earth-like places in the solar system, Titan remained shrouded by mystery for centuries due to its hazy and opaque orange atmosphere. It was only in the 20th century when we finally managed to peer through its clouds and discover a world full of possibilities. Much is said about life on Mars, but perhaps the place most likely to have alien life might be further beyond, orbiting Saturn right now. One thing is for sure though, if there is life on Titan, it would be nothing like we've ever seen. 
On July 30th, 2020, whilst the world was in the grip of a coronavirus pandemic, the Perseverance rover launched on an Atlas V541 rocket from Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida. Almost seven months later, on February 18th, 2021, the world watched on anxiously as Perseverance successfully landed on Yezido Crater Mars. The mission represents the first dedicated and directed search of signs of life on Mars since the Viking landers in 1976, and it is the first rover to attempt this. All the other Mars rover surface missions, including Spirit, Opportunity and Curiosity, were primarily designed to look for ancient signs of past open water on the Martian surface. They had some ability to perform geochemical analysis, and certainly, their camera capabilities could have detected obvious physical signs of past or present life. However, proof of life was not their primary purpose, and despite some claims on internet forums, officially, they didn't detect any obvious signs. However, there are scientists who think that the Viking landers did in fact detect signs of current life, although other scientists have been cautious about this, and have offered alternative explanations for the results of the Viking experiments. So now is the time to resolve this uncertainty. Perseverance is different, and its search for signs of life will be in two stages, one immediate and the other some years away. Let's take a look at these stages. This location was chosen because approximately 3.5 billion years ago, the crater was a lake that was fed by a river that coursed through the rim, creating a delta where sediment from elsewhere collected and settled. The lake bed itself around the edge of the crater appears to be permeated with calcium carbonate, which we know on Earth provides a suitable environment for the preservation of small organisms, including microbes. Sediments may have been transported considerable distances before settling in Yezido, and so the delta will provide a broad sampling of deposits swept up along the river's course, as well as signs within the crater lake itself. Perseverance carries an array of different types of cameras with different capabilities. There is Mast Cam Z on Perseverance's mast, which is able to perform a close-up visual inspection of anything that may look interesting. Mast Cam Z consists of two zoom cameras that can see 3D images in the red, green, blue spectrum, and also at the visible and near-infrared wavelengths. Supercam consists of a camera, two lasers, and four spectrometers. According to NASA, Supercam can identify the geochemical makeup of a target as small as a pencil point from a distance of 20 feet. Its lasers can vaporise interesting sediments into a tiny puff of plasma, which can be spectroscopically analysed for any interesting components. If Mastcam Z and Supercam come across interesting things, Perseverance will further investigate using Pixel, planetary instrument for X-ray lithochemistry, and Sherlock scanning habitable environments with Raman and luminescence for organics and chemicals. Pixel contains an ultra-small X-ray spectrometer and a camera, and can detect over 20 chemical markers of possible life in a sample as small as a grain of table salt. Pixel has a mobile component, sometimes described as a large insect, that will operate during Martian nights and when temperatures are more stable, and will move at 100 micron intervals to zoom in on potential targets. Sherlock uses a type of spectroscopy called Raman spectroscopy, which typically detects vibrational modes of individual species and molecules. This data will be superimposed on images taken by its camera, called Watson, to identify specific distributions of interesting chemistry, determining sampling locations for the second stage sample return mission. The main reason why NASA and ESA scientists spent time training in Pilbara in the Australian outback is that Pilbara is a site of some of the oldest signs of life on Earth, at least 3.5 billion years old. Among the fossils at Pilbara are accumulations of microbial mats that have been built up over billions of years to create what are called stromatolites. These are mounds of microbial cells interspersed with layers of calcium carbonate that can be quite large with a wavy layered structure. To the trained eye, they can be quite distinctive. Something like stromatolites may very well have been formed in the presence of microorganisms in the Yezido Crater Lake Basin around the calcium carbonate rim deposits and in the River Delta formation. This is why Mast Cam Z, Supercam, 
PIXL and Sherlock are so heavily loaded with various types of cameras and instruments for geochemical analysis. However, the scientists on Earth will still need to be able to recognise potentially interesting features and plan what instructions to send to the rovers to direct them to interesting and potentially promising formations. Of course, we have no way of knowing if there are stromatolites on Mars, but they seem like a very likely candidate for early and relatively easy recognised signs of microbial activity, and Yezido Crater is a prime candidate to have these kinds of things. Martian stromatolites do not have to look exactly like terrestrial stromatolites, and may not even have identifiable structure, since, on Earth, there are things called thrombolites, which are also collections of bacterial colonies, except that unlike stromatolites, they look like clumped tangles of sediment. But seeing this on Mars is also likely to be interesting and worth investigating. There may also have been simple organisms with shells on Mars, just as there have been on Earth, and these may also, in principle, be recognisable using the capabilities of the instruments on Perseverance, it seems extremely unlikely that we will see anything like snail shells or the chambered shells of various cephalopods, because we don't think that Mars was habitable long enough for such complex organisms to evolve. But we really won't know until we start looking. This will be an extraordinarily complex part of the mission, and will involve close cooperation with the ESA. The instrumentation required to definitively test for past or present life on Mars is just too complex, large and heavy to carry on a rover, and so they somehow need to have samples back here on Earth, to study in modern laboratories. Even a human crewed mission to Mars, still decades in the future, wouldn't be able to carry this kind of instrumentation and would still have to return samples to Earth, so they are going to do this robotically with the Mars sample return missions. Perseverance carries about 43 little titanium tubes with it, each less than 6 inches, or 15.2 centimetres long and hypersterilised, which will be used to store sediment core samples that it will drill and retrieve from any interesting sites its instrumentation has identified. These will be triple sealed and catched in predetermined places for later retrieval. The sampling, recovery and storage portion of the Perseverance mission is only supposed to last about two Earth years, although if the past is any indication of the future, Perseverance, with its plutonium power source, may last for many more years than that, and will continue to return data about Mars. In 2026, the sample lander and rover retrieval mission designed by the ESA will launch from the US and land on Mars. The rover will collect the samples and return them to the lander, which will have a small rocket and launch system on it to blast them into Mars's orbit. Because only some of the samples will fit into the orbiting sample canister, the rest will stay on Mars for future missions. The orbiting sample canister will achieve Mars's orbit for five years, until the ESA launches in 2031 with the Earth Return Orbiter, which will capture the orbiting canister and return it to Earth. And that is when the in-depth scientific analysis will begin. In the meantime, the ESA ExoMars, with the Rosalind Franklin lander, will have arrived at Mars by 2022 doing its own scientific investigations, and we will be getting results from that as well. The mission is nothing less than astonishing. The engineering and AI capabilities are difficult to fathom. The world stood still as they watched live the successful landing of Perseverance, but that was just the beginning of possibly 10 years of work that will hopefully prove once and for all, if there is, or once was, life on Mars. And if the stunning photographs that have emerged since Perseverance landed are anything to go by, it's going to be an exciting journey. When the ancient Greeks looked at the night sky and saw that some lights wouldn't stay fixed against the background and instead moved around the sky every night, they named them planets, which meant wanderers. Even before, Babylonian astronomers had already made extensive observations of the motions of these wanderers, identifying Venus, Mercury, Mars, Jupiter and Saturn as soon as the 7th century BC, but Uranus and Neptune, due to being further away from Earth, would only be identified millennia later by astronomers using telescopes in the 18th and 19th centuries. And ever since then, we've been on the hunt for the next planet orbiting the Sun. Recently, new evidence heated up the debate once more, as some astronomers are becoming increasingly convinced there could be, in fact, a true Planet Nine.
There are two ways you can find a planet in our solar system. By observing it moving relative to background stars, or by calculating disturbances in another planet's orbit. Ancient astronomers were already able to identify the planets from Mercury to Saturn, but finding Uranus and Neptune was a bit trickier. Uranus is still somewhat visible to the naked eye, but it was never recognised as a planet by ancient observers because of its dimness and slow orbit, taking more than 84 years to complete an orbit around the Sun. It was only in the 18th century when astronomers were able to track its movement, finally discovering the planet. Neptune, meanwhile, was found using math. When Uranus's movement deviated substantially from its calculated orbit, French astronomer Alexis Bouvard hypothesized that an unknown body was perturbing the orbit through gravitational interaction. After a few decades of calculations and observations, astronomers found Neptune in the exact spot of the sky where the math indicated it would be. But the astronomers weren't done. Later in the 19th century, subsequent observations of the ice giants led astronomers to speculate that Uranus's orbit was being disturbed by another planet besides Neptune, so the search for Planet X, as it was dubbed, began. Some decades later, in 1930, astronomer Clyde Tombaugh searched the solar system for over a year through the daunting process of systematically imaging the night sky in pairs of photographs, then examining each pair to determine whether any objects had shifted position. Using a blink comparator, a viewing apparatus that permits rapid switching from viewing one photograph to another, essentially blinking back and forth between the two, Tombaugh discovered a possible moving object on photographs from two different dates. This was later confirmed, and thus Pluto was discovered. However, the new planet's faintness and lack of resolvable disk cast doubt on the idea that it was Planet X, the one responsible for Uranus's further orbital deviations. Initially thought to be roughly the mass of Earth, Improved measurements revised Pluto's mass downward throughout the 20th century. Now we know Pluto to be even smaller than our own moon, far too tiny to influence the orbits of giants like Uranus or Neptune. In 1992, this orbital mystery was finally solved when mathematical astronomer Miles Standish used data from Voyager 2's flyby of Neptune, which had revised the estimates of Neptune's mass downward by 0.5%, an amount comparable to the mass of Mars to recalculate its gravitational effect on Uranus. With the new figures added in, the discrepancies, and with them the need for a planet X, vanished. Even worse for Pluto, in the beginning of the 21st century, discoveries of other trans-Neptunian objects of similar size like Eris, Haumea, and Makemake cast doubt in its classification as a planet. So in 2006, the International Astronomical Union created an official definition for the term planet which removed Pluto from the roster. It now joins the ranks of Ceres, Juno, Pallas, and Vesta, which were once considered planets as well during a brief period in the 19th century. And with this, the matter of the ninth planet was finally settled. For a time. Science really stays the same for too long, and a few years later, a new mystery would appear in our solar system, one that would bring back the Planet X discussion. The Kuiper Belt is a disk of asteroids starting close to Neptune's orbit and extending to about 50 astronomical units from the Sun. Similar to the inner asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, it consists mainly of small bodies or remnants from when the solar system formed, but it's much larger, 20 times as wide, and up to 200 times as massive. The first Kuiper Belt object was found in 1992, and since then, astronomers were able to detect hundreds of thousands of asteroids, comets, and dwarf planets residing in the belt. As more Kuiper Belt objects were found, however, one strange pattern began to emerge. Many of their orbits seemed disturbed in a way that only a large mass could be responsible. The gravitational effect of a sizable planet could explain this unlikely clustering of orbits for a group of extreme trans-Neptunian objects, known as ETNOs. This planet 9, as it became known, could be shepherding the orbits of the most distant known solar system objects, causing them to veer into this highly elliptical shape. In 2016, astronomers Konstantin Batygin and Michael E. Brown suggested that Planet 9 could be the core of a giant planet that was ejected from its original orbit by Jupiter during the genesis of the solar system, now orbiting the Sun in a highly elliptical orbit 
roughly 13 to 26 times the distance from Neptune to the Sun, which would make the planet take between 10,000 and 20,000 years to make one full orbit around the Sun. To be able to interfere in so many ETNOs in these specific ways, they estimate Planet 9 would have 5 to 10 times the mass of Earth, and a radius of 2 to 4 times the Earth's. Now with its orbit and size estimated, we just have to find it. If it exists, Planet 9 would be so distant from the Sun that it would reflect very little sunlight, potentially evading telescope sightings. Astronomers estimate the planet would have an apparent magnitude of less than 22, making it at least 600 times fainter than Pluto. This might be slightly beyond what our current telescopes can see, but a new generation of observatories is already being built for that exact purpose. The Vera C. Rubin Observatory is a giant telescope currently under construction in northern Chile, and it'll have a wide field 8.4 meter primary mirror capable of photographing the entire available sky in just a few nights. The observatory's mission will be the Legacy Survey of Space and Time, or LSST, a 10-year continuous survey of the southern sky, gathering data about the mysteries of dark energy and dark matter, the formation of our galaxy and the properties of small bodies in the solar system, the trajectories of bigger and potentially threatening asteroids and the existence of Planet Nine. However, what the LSST finds might end up not being a planet at all. Instead, it could be something far weirder. We already talked about black holes before, including the first ever direct imaging of one, but there are some weirder types of black holes that could exist since the beginning of time. In the early universe, very soon after the Big Bang, matter was so tightly packed together that any irregularity in density could have led sufficiently dense regions to undergo gravitational collapse, forming black holes. Since these primordial black holes didn't form from stellar gravitational collapse, their masses could be far below stellar mass. In 2019, a paper by astronomers Jacob Schultz and James Unwin investigated the possibility that Planet Nine could, instead of a planet, be one of those yet undetected primordial black holes. A few months later, another team of researchers at the University of Tokyo reanalyzed data from the five-year optical gravitational lensing experiment, or OGLE, a research project that images the sky using advanced telescopes over long periods of time. The team was trying to explain an excess in microlensing events on the OGLE's data, a form of gravitational lens where the light from a background source is bent by the gravitational field of a foreground lens to create brightened images. Their conclusion? There is evidence to suggest that primordial black holes of similar mass to Planet Nine could exist. Their sizes would be extremely small, less than 10 centimeters across, but their gravity would still be powerful enough to disturb nearby objects. By interacting with surrounding dark matter, these tiny black holes could turn it into gamma radiation. Thus we could detect them with instruments like the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope, or the LSST. Searching for new planets in our solar system has always been one of the holy grails of astronomy, and even today that hasn't changed. The new evidence for a Planet Nine or even a possible new type of black hole excites scientists all over the world, and the next generation of groundbreaking surveys like the LSST are perfectly suited for the job, so we might have a definitive answer in just a few years. Perhaps by the next decade, science books will change again, and the solar system will have nine planets once more, or a slightly cooler, darker, and tinier equivalent. Thank you for joining us in this episode of Access Astronomy. We hope to see you here next time when we continue to point our telescopes at the sky and seek out the mysteries of the universe.